www.ohiomedicalsciences.org. The House Rules Subcommittee today held a hearing on relations between the legislative and executive branches. Members heard from the chairman of several committees and subcommittees on the successes and difficulties they've had in dealing with the executive branch. Georgia Congressman John Linder chaired the three-hour and 15-minute hearing. The uh, meeting of the subcommittee will come to order. Today, this subcommittee will examine institutional issues relating to congressional oversight and the number of roadblocks encountered in the process. Congress must be able to carry out effective oversight to deter waste and abuse and ensure that executive policies reflect the public interest. Unfortunately, when Congress directs its oversight at the executive branch, agencies frequently assert questionable right to shield information Congress deems essential to carry out its oversight functions. This subcommittee, which has jurisdiction over institutional issues, such as the implementation of rules and prerogatives of the House, will hear from five distinguished chairmen who will offer their insights into the oversight process. They'll explain some of the problems that their committees have encountered from the executive branch, and we will begin a dialogue about how to more effectively conduct oversight and protect institutional privileges and prerogatives. This is the first of several hearings we'll hold reviewing congressional oversight. I expect that we'll hear testimony about the Department of Justice, not only because of any particular animosity toward the department, but because oversight of the department poses some of the most interesting and problematic aspects of oversight. The department also often dictates the extent to which other departments and agencies comply with congressional requests. Let me say at the outset that I appreciate the difficult oversight work that these chairmen do. Program oversight and investigation and investigations are time consuming and often without immediate political or policy reward. Every chairman before us today has faced intense media scrutiny while conducting their important oversight work. I commend them all. Every member of Congress should be interested in ensuring efficient and effective governmental operations. Congress has a responsibility to improve the efficiency of the government operations, detect and prevent waste and abuse, ensure that executive policies reflect the public interest, and prevent executive encroachment on legislative authority and prerogatives. These bipartisan goals may be accomplished through congressional oversight. In an effort to accomplish these goals, Speaker Hastert and Chairman Dreyer have asked that the Congressional Research Service conduct a series of bipartisan oversight workshops for members and staff in order to improve Congress's ability to conduct oversight. Two of these sessions have already been held, and the third will be held on Monday, July 26. This hearing will build on those bipartisan sessions by exploring cur current issues facing committees and will allow us to focus on ways to improve oversight. Oversight is one of the most important constitutional functions of the Congress. The history of congressional oversight includes the failed St. Clair expedition in 1792 through Teapot Dome, Watergate, Iran-Contra, and Whitewater. In affirming the Congress's oversight powers, the Supreme Court in McGrain versus Doherty stated that the power of inquiry with process to enforce it is an essential and appropriate auxiliary to the legislative function. The court also observed that a legislative body cannot legislate wisely or effectively in the absence of information respecting the conditions which the legislation is intended to affect or change. Congressional oversight is integral to the checks and balances inherent in our system of government in which one branch serves as a counterbalance to the excesses of the other. The duty of the legislature, John Stuart Mill wrote, in consideration of representative government is to watch and control the government, to throw the light of publicity on its acts, to compel a full exposition and justification of all of them, which anyone considers questionable, to censure them if found condemnable. Woodrow Wilson stated quite as important as legislation is vigilant oversight of administration, because Wilson believed that the only really self-governing people is that people which discusses and interrogates its administration. He concluded that the inform informing function should be preferred to its legislative function. It is for these reasons that oversight, particularly oversight of the Department of Justice, is critical. We are not the first to inquire into the deeds or misdeeds of the department. One need not go far back in history to recall that Chairman Dingell investigated the department's environmental crimes program. It is worth noting that the Attorney General Reno and the Associate Attorney General Webb Hubble permitted the staff of the Commerce Committee to interrogate line prosecutors for that Dingell investigation. The Science Committee's Rocky Flats investigation and Iran-Contra both brought the Department of Justice under the congressional microscope. Then Chairman Brooks, in the early 1990s, battled the department over her INSLAW investigation. In opposition to congressional oversight, opposition to congressional oversight is not a new phenomenon either. 
However, the Justice Department in recent years has been particularly uncooperative with congressional and other investigators. The department has a longstanding policy against sharing information with congressional committees, which in their view may adversely impact ongoing investigations. As a strong supporter of law enforcement, I am sympathetic to this view. However, when the department's policy is so strained that it invents unfounded legal arguments, such as the protective function privilege, the department loses credibility with the Congress and the American people. In the McGrain case, the Supreme Court focused specifically on Congress's authority to study charges of malfeasance and nonfeasance in the Department of Justice. The court noted with approval that the subject to be investigated by the Congressional Committee was the administration of the Department of Justice. Whether its functions were being properly discharged or were being neglected or misdirected, and particularly whether the Attorney General and his assistants were performing or neglecting their duties in respect of the institution and prosecution or proceedings to, pun to punish crimes. It is clear then that the Congress has the legal authority to demand the production of information necessary for Congress to properly discharge its oversight responsibility and that the Department of Justice is subject to such oversight. Congress must remain vigilant in its oversight of all executive branch agencies. Former Chairman Dingell and Brooks and former House General Counsels Ross and Brandt firmly advocated and implemented Congress's oversight responsibility. The American people should be concerned about prosecutorial misconduct and should be confident that the Congress will review such cases to ensure that it does not happen repeatedly. If Congress wants explanations or answers about such conduct, conduct it should not be met with platitudes about policy, prosecutorial discretion, or privileges. Congress and the American people deserve answers to such important questions. The potential for abuse in the administration of justice is great, and Congress must remain vigilant with its oversight. Finally, I want to comment on the new post-independent counsel area we now are entering. Recently, a number of Republican and Democrat commentators criticized Congress for delegating its oversight responsibility to independent counsels. Now, with the expiration of the independent counsel statute, the Attorney General has promulgated reg regulations governing the appointment, conduct, and removal of special counsels. The regulations place special counsels clearly under the control of an Attorney General how can Congress be assured that special counsels are independent? How can the American people be assured that undue political influence is not being brought to bear against special counsels? If the Attorney General refuses to answer questions about the appointment of special counsels the same way that she refused to answer questions about independent counsels, how can Congress be assured that impartial justice will be done? In addition, one member of Congress recently criticized Congress for its oversight relating to the Department of Energy's nuclear labs. Congress must remain vigilant because it will be blamed when things go wrong. Congress must continue to exercise continuous watchfulness over programs and agencies within their jurisdiction because Congress's institutional constitutional oversight function is implicit in our tripartite system of government. Congress must more than ever be properly meet its lawmaking and informing responsibility. The subcommittee hearing offers an opportunity to review not only the congressional oversight function that serves as a vital tool for keeping the nation free, but also the inherent dangers of permitting agencies to impede the work of Congress. I am happy now to begin to hear from our chairs as they have had their experiences. I'm sorry, Mr. Hall has a statement. I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do have a statement and a couple of uh, inserts that I'd like to have as part of the record. I. I'm not going to read the whole statement. There are about two or three paragraphs I would like to read. And I'll just start off by saying that the success of congressional oversight should be determined by how well we evaluate the laws that we pass and whether that oversight results in new legislation, including changes in existing law. In addition, we need to be concerned about basic process. Is our oversight, is it cost effective? Can we expect the results of a particular investigation to justify the money spent? Are the rights of the witnesses protected? The authority to investigate is an awesome power. It's subject to abuse. We must not forget that some of the darkest moments in Congress were the result of overzealous execution over the, of the oversight responsibility. Is oversight conducted on a bipartisan basis? This is especially important when investigations take on an adversarial tone as they must from time to time, but without bipartisan support, oversight takes on, unfortunately, political tones that discredit the oversight process in the House. That's all I'm going to read, Mr. Chairman. I, 
I, I'm, I'm glad that you're having this here, and I am concerned about the fact that what Congress could do and do it well is oversight. But what I see so much is investigations. And I see not only investigations, it's so partisan. And when I go back home, people always say to me, why can't you guys get together? Why can't the members of Congress uh, on both sides get together and work together? And over the past few years, it just looks so investigatory, uh, you know, relative to the whole process of what this committee hearing is all about today is that oversight. That's one of the things that we can do best is to evaluate our laws, evaluate our agencies. How are they doing? And I know that's part of it. I know that's part of what we're doing today, but it doesn't seem that's what we're doing. And I just hope that uh, through this hearing that we can, we can get to the point where we can be a lot more bipartisan in the way that we investigate, the way we look at agencies, the way we look at our government doesn't seem to be that way. So I'm very thankful for the chance to be here. Uh, as you know, this is a busy day. Uh, I'm carrying several bills for the Rules Committee on the floor, so from time to time I'll be coming in and out of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Dreher. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I want to congratulate you and Mr. Hall for holding what I think is clearly one of the most important uh, hearings that we will deal with in this Congress. I think that Mr. Hall is uh, in large part correct that a lot of time has been expended in the past on political oversight. But at the beginning of the 106th Congress, Speaker Hastert and I sat down and talked about the great importance of policy and programmatic oversight. In fact, that our constitutional responsibility really does move us, uh, should move us uh, in that direction. And uh, that's why, again, this uh, hearing is is so important. By examining some of the toughest examples of oversight, we're able to learn about and improve the oversight system that is something we all hope uh, very much to accomplish today. As I said, uh, the speaker and I have uh, spent a great deal of time on this. We're committed to improving and emphasizing this issue of, as you say, Tony, programmatic oversight. That's why we jointly asked the Congressional Research Service to conduct bipartisan oversight training for congressional staff. Two of our sessions have already been held on that, and the third will be held on the uh, 26th of July. And so far, the reports that we've gotten have uh, indicated a great deal of success. In fact, I'd like to ask unanimous consent at this point, Mr. Chairman, to include the letters that we had w with the uh, Congressional Research Service included uh, in the record. As our first workshop uh, uh, pointed out, we had uh, our former colleague, Lee Hamilton, who is obviously a very, very respected former member. He was chairman of what used to be called the Foreign Affairs Committee. Now I'm proudly uh, called the International Relations Committee. And he also chaired uh, the Iran-Contra Committee. And frankly, he was involved in some of those other investigations, Tony, that may have been a little politically motivated in the past. Uh, at that meeting, he addressed uh, the attendees, and uh, I'd ask unanimous consent to include Chairman Hamilton's uh, statement in the record uh, at this point. And then I'd like to just uh, highlight a couple of the, uh, the items that he raised. He said, oversight is designed to throw light on the activities of government. It can protect the country from the imperial presidency and from bureaucratic arrogance. It can expose and prevent misconduct and maintain a degree of constituency influence in an administration. The responsibility of oversight is to look into every nook and cranny of governmental affairs. Oversight is designed to look at everything the government does, expose it, and put the light of publicity to it. It reviews, monitors, and supervises the execution and implementation of public policy to assure that the laws are faithfully executed. Now, let me say that uh, bipartisanship is something that we have been seeking. And we all know that uh, Lee Hamilton is a Democrat, and I will say that uh, he's one who believes very strongly uh, in this. And in the memo that we had in preparing us uh, for this hearing today, I mean, I, I think there were a number of very important quotes, not only pointing to the Supreme Court, but, uh, and, and you uh, have covered a couple of them, Mr. Chairman, but uh, I want to say that uh, I think that Woodrow Wilson uh, said it very well when he said, quite as important as legislation is vigilant oversight of administration. Because Wilson believed, and, uh, and I quote, the only really self-governing people is that people which discusses 
and interrogates its administration. And uh, he concluded that the informing function of Congress should be preferred to its legislative function. So I think that so often we uh, believe that we are simply lawmakers here, but we have a very, very important responsibility that we cannot ignore. We have uh, very distinguished, we have a couple of, of uh, very powerful committee chairmen sitting before us and a couple of equally powerful subcommittee chairmen who are going to talk about this issue. We have uh, uh, information that has come to the forefront just today in the Washington Post in an article uh, that we've seen about problems that exist uh, at the Justice Department. And uh, so I'm, I'm happy that we in the 106th Congress are trying to pursue in a bipartisan way this issue of policy and programmatic oversight. And I look forward to the uh, testimony of our very distinguished colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Mr. Hastings. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, uh, look, very, look forward to the testimony of uh, our witnesses we have here today. If there's one thing that uh, I've heard in my short time in Congress uh, over and over from my constituents is uh, it, it kind of follows the vein of uh, what about this action that happened? Uh, why did that happen and what are you doing about it? And what about this action and so forth? And, of course, I, I explain to them that uh, our responsibility is to uh, set, make the law, and their, the executive branch's responsibility is obviously to carry out that law. Uh, but at some time, there has to be some accountability as to if they are following it as it is, uh, as, we, uh, as we passed it and as we thought the intent was. And so I look forward to, uh, to hearing a testimony, uh, particularly one of the subcommittee chairmen that I've worked with on oversight of uh, of uh, some federal activities in my area, Mr. Barton. So uh, I, uh, I look forward to this uh, testimony, and I think and I make, might make one other uh, observation, and this is uh, this I think may be a, a appropriate time to say this because we uh, this committee does have some responsibility, has some responsibility uh, on the budget process, and I have been one that has been uh, an advocate of biennial budgets because that would give us then uh, an opportunity in the second half of, of uh, congressional session to uh, have uh, more oversight without having having that pressures uh, of the budget in order to get that done. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the time. I yield back and look forward to the testimony. Thank you. Ms. Myrick? Thank you. I would uh, just say that I'm looking forward to your testimony, and uh, we hope some um, good things come out of this. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I would, I'm pleased to join my fellow members of the Rules Committee today in welcoming, welcoming the five distinguished committee chairmen and panel before us, and I look forward to their testimony. The issue at hand, congressional oversight of the executive branch, often solicits strong feelings from members of Congress. Many members have experienced frustration in getting accurate information and data in a timely manner from administration agencies. Some believe the administration delays responding to requests from certain members of Congress for political reasons. I perhaps am one of those. I have experienced myself problems in dealing with the FBI and the Bureau of, uh, of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Both agencies have not responded to letters which I have sent and resent and resent and made repeated calls. In December of last year, I wrote a letter to Mr. John McGall, director of the BATF, requesting a copy of their Operation Snapshot. The BATF asserted that this study showed that pawn store customers were far more likely to be prohibited from possessing guns than customers of other federal firearm licensees. I received no response to my December request for a copy of the study. I wrote again in February. Again, no response, not even a letter acknowledging my request, not at all. You may recall last month I offered a reasonable amendment to the juvenile justice bill that required pawn stores to do a background check before returning a gun to its owner. 
this reasonable amendment required a background check to be done only when the gun was held for a year or longer. The amendment passed with bipartisan support. When my amendment came to the floor for debate, I was confronted by opponents to the measure who were quoting statistics from BATF, statistics from the very study which I requested, statistics from the study which BATF would not provide to me. One opponent to my amendment said authoritatively that, the, that the, this BATF study showed that 5.4% of pawn store customers were prohibited from possessing guns. In the meantime, I was left to wonder how on earth I could refute these statistics. How could I challenge the methodology of the study? My opponents were all quoting this study, and I could not even get a copy. In my opinion, a copy of the information that was used, that my opponents were privy to, I was denied. I believe that it was done for political purposes, and further, I believe that it would be a serious breach or violations of the ethics of the Treasury Department. I intend to further pursue the matter, but would be interested in hearing about how you think this should be approached. This week, after the juvenile justice bill and my amendment were considered on the floor, yet curiously, just before the hearings on oversight of the executive branch and its agencies such as the BATF, I finally received a reply from Director McGall. He writes, the Operation Snapshot Study is in the process of being finalized and will be made available to all interested parties once it is completed. We will send you a copy at that time. My first reaction to the question was, why would it take seven months to reply to me that the study is not complete? Then I thought back to the battle on the House floor over my amendment. How could opponents of my amendment be quoting from a study that was not yet complete? How could the administration support increasing regulations based upon numbers and statistics that are incomplete? The bottom line is, is that I believe that there are inconsistencies that we find from this administration, not only from the Department of Justice, but other agencies, where based upon political reasons, we are being denied as members of Congress who are considering realistic and uh, very <coughs> important issues of this country. We are being denied the opportunity not only to discuss these issues, but being treated fairly. I hope that part of what this oversight hearing is about today is to reinforce that there are members of Congress, not just myself, that have sincere problems that we wish to deal with, and I believe that, that uh, the light of day uh, will prove to be a good disinfectant for this problem. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, thank the panel for participating uh, this morning in this very important hearing. As a freshman, I've had limited exposure to congressional oversight of federal agencies, but I can tell you I've already been here long enough to come across difficulties with federal departments in the past seven months. One of the most startling issues in my district involves both the Interior and the Justice Departments. These departments, particularly Justice, got involved in a dispute that goes back some 200 years between the Cayuga Indian Nation and New York State. The dispute is over 64,000 acres of land. The original suit was filed by the Cayuga Indians in 1980, and 11,000 residents have spent the last 19 years terrified that they may lose their very homes from this 200-year-old uh, uh, dispute. The Justice Department's involvement is not only inappropriate, but it has been significantly slowing down the entire proceedings and has had a negative impact on innocent landowners. In my experience, the agencies have overstepped their bounds, and they have been unavailable, unresponsive, and unapologetic to the Congress and to the public. That has to change in order for our government to function efficiently or in some cases to function at all. Again, I'd like to thank the gentlemen. I look forward to their testimony and know that they will have expert presentations on this subject. Chairman, I would like to ask unanimous consent that uh, some information that I have concerning letters and other information that I discussed be submitted for the record. Thank you.
because of the scope. Because of, because of the scheduling urgencies, I'm going to ask the gentleman from Texas who has another committee go meeting of roughly at the same time to begin. And uh, we'll ask each of you to make your statements and then we'll ask questions. And I understand, Mr. Martin, you may have to leave toward. Gentlemen may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the other members of the uh, Rural Subcommittee on this issue. Let me uh, put this in context. 1995, when the Republicans became the majority for the first time in 40 years, I became the Oversight Subcommittee Chairman of the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, a position that uh, uh, Congressman Dingell of Michigan had uh, been double-hatted. He was full committee chairman of the committee and also subcommittee chairman. The records were somewhat hard to uh, determine, but we were able to ascertain that uh, Chairman Dingell, on his oversight subcommittee staff, had over 40 direct employees and approximately uh, 100, perhaps more, detailees. And to put that in context, uh, at the zenith of my chairmanship, we had approximately 12 direct employees and two detailees to do oversight over approximately 40 percent of the, uh, the federal government. Now, I don't believe that anybody would say that uh, uh, Congressman Dingell was lax in his oversight uh, responsibilities. Uh, so uh, Chairman Bliley, the full committee, and myself as chairman of the subcommittee had uh, big shoes to fill, and we tried to do it uh, uh, in, a, in an effective way. I'm going to talk about three specific cases. Uh, we did. Um, at the staff level, we probably did several hundred investigations in the four years I was chairman. Uh, we had approximately 100 hearings. Uh, we had uh, hundreds of witnesses appear. In only one or two cases did we resort to subpoena power to, uh, to get the, uh, the, the documents that we needed. And with one exception, I think all of our investigations would be construed to be uh, bipartisan and to also to be uh, fact-based with, uh, with either no political overtones or, or, or minimal political overtones. The first case I want to specifically refer to deals with the Environmental Protection Agency, and it deals with a program within that agency of the Diesel Engine Certification Program. That's hardly a, a political uh, investigation. We began our review in late 1997 out of a concern that there may have been attempts by the manufacturers to circumvent federal emission standards. The EPA may have been asleep at the, asleep at the wheel. For a year, we put off certain aspects of our investigation at the request of the Environmental Protection Agency and the Justice Department based on their representation that our inquiries might negatively impact pending enforcement actions. However, after the EPA, Justice, and the manufacturers entered into a settlement agreement in October of 19. 98, Justice continued to block our attempts to interview the EPA personnel. In one moment of unusual candor, EPA acknowledged to the staff of my subcommittee that the administration's concern was that our investigation might uncover information embarrassing to its settlement position. Eventually, EPA did permit us to interview the program personnel, despite a memorandum from the Justice Department advising EPA against doing so. I, to this day, question the judgment of the Justice Department in continuing to advocate an obstructionist and extreme position. If the Justice Department had had its way, our investigation would have been delayed indefinitely. And if that same Justice Department theory were to be applied across the board, virtually every congressional oversight activity could be negatively affected since there are very few executive branch actions that are insulated from the potential of future litigation. So that's case number one, dealing with the EPA. Second case is a request that I made to the Justice Department in March of 1996 to investigate a matter that I had reason to believe, and still to this day continue to believe, constituted perjury before my subcommittee. And that, in support of that request, I enclosed a committee staff report detailing the evidence that led us to believe that a senior Food and Drug Administration, or FDA official, a gentleman by the name of Mitch Zeller, committed perjury at hearings before the subcommittee on November the 15th and December the 5th, 1995. And let me say, Mr. Chairman, 
that all testimony in the Oversight Subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee is taken under oath, that we require them to hold up their hands and swear an oath that they're, they're telling the truth, the entire truth, nothing but the truth, so help them God, so help them God. So, so we don't have any of this. Uh, you can claim that you uh, are not sworn to tell the truth and, and be under oath before the Oversight Subcommittee. The facts of the case uh, are laid out in my prepared remarks, but let me briefly state, state the issue if I can. Mr. Zeller came before the committee and, 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 and testified about certain documents that he had been given by a, an outside counsel who was involved in litigation uh, with the FDA on a device called a pedicle screw. And this, these documents were under a court order to be sealed as confidential. And one of the documents, which, which I never saw, was a book about apparently three inches thick that was stamped on the front in big letters, confidential court order, you know, subject to, to all kinds of things. And it was, it was obviously uh, uh, well, well marked. We requested these documents. The FDA refused to give us the documents on the grounds that they were, sub they were subject to a protective order, okay? We, the, we then held two hearings during which Mr. Zeller testified about these documents. Months later, when the subcommittee received the documents that had initially been withheld by the FDA, there were notable conflicts between the documents and the testimony that Mr. Zeller gave at our hearing under oath. In particular, the documents contradicted Mr. Zeller's testimony that he did not know at the time that the documents he received in, in June of 1995 were covered by a protective order. Now, I want to emphasize, under oath and questioned by myself, Mr. Cox of California, and several other members of the subcommittee, Mr. Zeller admitted that he had the documents. He admitted that he read the documents. There was even a personal note from the person who sent him the documents in which he was saluted on a first name basis, but he, he continued to state that, that he did not know they were subject to a protective order. Now, if you had these documents before us today, uh, every member of this subcommittee, of the Rules Committee, could clearly tell that these documents were subject to a protective order of the court. Mr. Zeller testified the documents he received were stamped confidential. He testified that he had read and used the documents. So. When he said that, um, that he didn't know that they were under seal or he didn't know that they, they were protected by the court order, I don't believe that Mr. Zeller's testimony was credible. Mr. Zeller also testified that he did not have any previous dealings with the person who sent him the documents, a gentleman by the name of Cole, C-O-A-L-E, or know that he would be receiving the documents in advance, statements that also appear to be false. The cover letter to Mr. Zeller enclosing the documents contained the salutation that read, Dear Mitch, stated, the, and I quote, the enclosed is the material that we spoke of. The personal salutation implies to me a pre-existing relationship. And the statement we spoke of earlier suggests to me that Mr. Zeller knew that he would be receiving the documents and that the subject matter of those documents and that he did have a previous relationship in dealing with Mr. Cole. My request to the Attorney General to investigate this alleged perjury was referred to the Public Integrity Section. On May the 8th, 1996, we brought additional information about another related, what we claim to be a false statement to the attention of the Department of Justice. This time a clearly false statement in a judicial brief filed by the Department on behalf of the FDA to, to the effect that no one outside the FDA's Office of General Counsel had been given access to these protective order documents. In other words, it appeared at the same, that at the same time the Justice Department on behalf of FDA was asking written permission from the court to receive and use documents subject to a protective order, FDA was trying to cover up the fact that it had already received and used some of those very same documents subject to that very same protective order. In August of 1996, the Department of Justice summarily re decided not to proceed further with my formal request for an investigation of this matter. The department's declination letter did not even address the question raised by my May 8th letter, request to investigate a possible false statement to the department. The department gave the committee only minimal information about the Department of Justice's efforts. We were told that perjury 
and the committee will, will like this answer. We were told that perjury is an extremely difficult crime to prosecute and that there was insufficient evidence, evidence to prosecute. As far as I can tell, all the Justice Department did for over four months was review my referral and request materials from the FDA. Neither I nor the committee staff was provided specific information about whether the Justice Department attempted to interview Mr. Cole or FDA officials connected with this matter. We were given no written report or any indication that the referral was investigated with any degree of energy or thoroughness. By contrast, in 1990, a U.S. attorney prosecuted and convicted an FDA official for lying about whether he had had lunch with industry representatives. A few years later, a senior FDA official testifies before my subcommittee that he received and used documents that were clearly marked confidential subject protective order. And he knew that they were confidential, but denied that he knew the documents were subject to a protective order, and the same Justice Department does nada, nothing, zip. That testimony is similar to someone who receives a box stamped dangerous radioactive material and testifies that he knew the box was dangerous, but not radioactive. The testimony was inherently preposterous and justified a further vigorous investigation by the Department of Justice about perjury before Congress. Justice is in action and its refusal to provide any detailed explanation to my subcommittee was, I believe, and is, I believe, simply inexcusable. So that deals with the FDA. The first case was the EPA. The second case is the FDA. Now let's try one more case. I want to say right on the top, this case does have political overtones. I don't believe the other two did, but this one does. The third case involved a criminal referral to the Justice Department by myself as subcommittee chairman and full committee chairman Tom Bliley on a matter that is known in the public today as the portals, after the name of a privately developed building that the Federal Communications Commission recently moved into after years of refusing to do so. My subcommittee investigation uncovered a complex web of influence peddling and questionable, to put it mildly, million-dollar payments of secret meetings and curious government actions all relating to this project. At the end of the investigation, we determined that the evidence was sufficient to refer the matter to the Justice Department for criminal investigation of several prominent individuals, including James Sasser, who is currently the ambassador to China for the United States of America and a former senator from Tennessee, Mr. Peter Knight, who is a top fundraiser for Vice President Gore and President Clinton, and Mr. Franklin Haney, who is a private developer in Tennessee, who is a close friend of the Vice President's and a top uh, contributor also to Democratic causes. If the Justice Department is, is to, and if the Justice Department themselves is to be believed, a very questionable Clinton-Gore fundraiser. Now, the Justice Department does have an investigation of Mr. Haney in which he is is uh, currently under indictment, I believe, for over 30 counts of um, uh, campaign finance law violations. The subcommittee staff prepared a lengthy, detailed, and fact-based report based on the testimony and interviews with dozens of individuals in review of thousands of documents. That report was sent to Attorney General Reno for her review on December the 15th, 1998. As that report exhaustively set forth, we found that Mr. Haney paid Mr. Knight and Mr. Sasser $1 million each upon the successful closing of the portals transaction, in which the federal government agreed to specific lease changes sought by Mr. Haney as a condition for his financing of the portals building. We believe then, as I continue to believe now, that the report set forth specific and credible evidence warranting further investigation as to whether Mr. Haney and his representatives may have violated federal laws in connection with these fee arrangements. In particular, the federal law against contingency fees on federal contracts. The report also contained evidence suggesting that the same individuals may have made false statements under oath before the subcommittee concerning the fee arrangement and their efforts to influence federal officials. In the specific case of Peter Knight, who was a covered official under the Independent Counsel Act, we indicated our belief to the Attorney General of the United States of America there was, and I quote, specific and credible information warranting a preliminary in investigation into whether an independent counsel should be appointed to review this matter. Under that act, the burden of the Attorney General is clear. If the Attorney General cannot say with certitude and within 30 days that the information provided is not specific or from a credible source, 
the Attorney General must proceed with the preliminary investigation under the Act. However, on the 30th day, the committee received a cursory response from the Justice Department stating that the Department's own investigation had previously determined, apparently prior to even receiving or reviewing our referral, that Mr. Knight's $1 million payment was not an illegal contingency fee and therefore it would not begin a preliminary inquiry under the Independent Counsel Act. The Department's response raises many procedural and substantive red flags. First, the response, which is notably never said, which notably never said whether the specific pieces of evidence contained in the referral met the minimal triggering threshold under the Act, appears to indicate that such an analysis was not even performed by the Department. Instead, it appears that the Department simply relied upon a prior investigation internally and its own judgment that the $1 million payment was not a contingency fee and interpreted the referral's evidence to conform with its initial determination. Second, the response indicates that the Department reached a conclusion on the facts that the payment was not a contingency fee as opposed to making the statutorily required finding of whether the referral contains specific and credible evidence warning the investigation, a further investigation. Third, the Department appears to resolve disputed credibility issue in Mr. Knight's favor based on unidentified, and I quote, other evidence gathered by the Department's task force, a weighing of evidence that I believe the Act requires to be left to an independent prosecutor, independent counsel. And finally, contrary to the Department's response, Justice's apparent conclusion that the $1 million payment was not an unlawful contingency fee did not resolve all of the perjury-related referrals on Mr. Knight, an obvious error that indicates the lack of serious attention given to our referral. On the substance of the Attorney General's decision, let me briefly state that I, along with others knowledgeable about the referral and the workings of the Act, find it virtually impossible to believe that the referral failed to meet, failed to set forth specific and credible informa information against Mr. Knight, warranting further review under the Independent Counsel Act. The referral contained testimony of individuals with personal knowledge of the matter, backed by corroborative documentation that generally went unchallenged by Mr. Knight and Mr. Haney. Although Mr. Knight claimed that his $1 million payment was a flat fee for three years of work on dozens of projects for Mr. Haney from 1995 through 98, the committee heard testimony and received documentary evidence, all of which was provided to the Department, clearly indicating the opposite. In order to give the subcommittee a sense of how incredible the Attorney General's response to our referral truly was, I have recounted in my formal lengthy statement some of the key evidence contained in our referral and would be glad to answer questions about that. So let me simply say in closing, we understand there's going to be a natural tension between the executive branch and the legislative branch. That's institutional and that's normal. Uh, I would say in the case of the Clinton administration, there is an endemic attitude that there should be no cooperation with the Congress. And in, in the case specifically of the Justice Department, I think they have uh, gone above and beyond the call of duty uh, in trying to stonewall at least the subcommittee that I was the subcommittee chairman of on oversight's investigation of the Commerce Committee. Now, I've got lots of more documentation. I'll put that in the record, Mr. Chairman, but I appreciate the opportunity to testify on these specific cases. We thank you very much, and we may be sending some questions to you because we understand you can't return. I think we have time for one more before we vote, which will be at five minutes until the hour. So, Mr. Hoekstra. I thank uh, the chairman and the committee for, uh, for having this hearing today. just want to uh, begin with and set, set the record straight. I think uh, our subcommittee and a number of other uh, subcommittees have done a lot of work, which is more than what would be called the political investigative. Uh, early in uh, 1997, we embarked on a process in our subcommittee to take a look at all uh, the education programs, identifying over 700 education programs administered during over 39 different agencies and issued a report called Education at a Crossroads. That is now the framework for uh, an education agenda working its way through the House of Representatives. Uh, within the next uh, three weeks, we will issue a, a report called the American Worker Project, which is the first comprehensive look at American labor law. Uh, and we believe that this will then set the framework for uh, a legislative agenda on how to reform American labor law and get it ready for uh, the next millennium so that our workers will be competitive on a global basis. 
But the, uh, the investigation that uh, I want to focus on this morning is the work that we did on the Teamsters in the last Congress. The, uh, how does Congress get involved with the International Brotherhood of Teamsters? We became involved with the Teamsters because in 1996 there was an election. Uh, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters uh, had a national election for president. The interesting thing about this election was that it was funded by the, uh, by the American taxpayer. It was funded to the tune of uh, $20 million that the American taxpayer uh, footed for the, a failed election. And uh, we were asked at that point in time to do an investigation as to what happened in that election uh, and why, when you spent uh, that kind of money, we couldn't run a fair election. It goes back to the election officer. She overturned the election because she found that the campaign of the incumbent president, uh, Ron Kerry, engaged in a, quote, a complex, complex network of schemes, end of quote, to launder union treasury funds and other prohibited contributions through various organizations back into the Kerry campaign. The interesting thing then is to take a look at who were participated in this. Citizen Action, the National Council of Senior Citizens, Project Vote, the FLCIO, the DNC, and the Clinton, Corps, Clinton Gore 96 campaign. These were agencies that, and organizations that had a direct political uh, agenda, and a number of these received funds from Congress. From the outset, we ran into a number of things that were problematic. The first of which was that we did not have minority support. The minority focused on procedural issues and personal attacks in an effort to change the subject. Bottom line is what I think the chairman started with. For an investigation to be truly effective and credible, there must be cooperation on both sides of the aisle. If there is not, the minority or one of the parties can do a lot to slow down an investigation, which is what happened in our case. Our investigation was also limited because several important witnesses asserted their Fifth Amendment privileges against self-incrimination and refused to testify. In addition, the Teamsters, and I want to, when I'm talking about the Teamsters, I want to reinforce that I'm talking about the administration of, of Ron Carey and not the administration that is currently in place uh, that was elected in a genuine election and a fair election. But the previous administration took a confrontational position and they were generally uncooperative. Their lawyers asserted numerous privileges and withheld many documents. That is until they were threatened with contempt. Until they were threatened with contempt. They produced other documents that were redacted, but the only thing that we received was meaningless information. The Teamsters refused to allow interviews of their employees and agents. Ultimately, our investigation was granted deposition authority and we were able to speak with uncooperative witnesses. It required a long and complicated process. And I think as the chairman uh, notes that it culminated with a vote on the floor of the House to get this power. As soon as we were provided with the necessary tools, the Teamsters were suddenly much more cooperative and, and insisted that their appearances be voluntary and without subpoena. I really think that the Rules Committee ought to consider providing deposition authority to all subcommittees as part of the standing rules of the House of Representatives. The subcommittee's efforts to investigate the Teamsters election misconduct was also limited in deference to requests made by the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York. On numerous occasions, the subcommittee refrained from questioning witnesses and pursuing certain, certain areas of inquiry at the request of the Southern District. The Southern District did not want their criminal investigation to be tainted and the subcommittee respected their wishes. In practical terms, the Department of Justice objected to the sub subcommittee pursuing any investigation of the alleged contribution swap schemes. My experience in working with the Department of Justice is that it is a one-way street when it comes to interacting with congressional investigations. We share information with them. They shroud everything in the veil of secrecy. Either their inv information involves restricted grand jury material or it in involves an ongoing criminal matter. DOJ seems to overplay what information involves an open case and apparently will not provide Congress with any information on any issue that they might investigate somewhere down the line. I think that in summary my 
interaction with the Department of Justice was probably the most frustrating. When I take a look at the evidence that was laid out in the guilty uh, uh, pleas that they did receive early on in the investigation, the organizations that were involved, and our action over the, the year, the year and a half that we investigated this and how we cooperated with the dust, Justice Department, and then to see what has happened in that year and a half and in the year since that, there's been no activity out of the Justi Justice Department which would have justified the restraints and the straitjacket that they put on our subcommittee. They wouldn't share information with us. Even within the last few months, they wouldn't come and testify in front of our subcommittee about what went wrong in the first election, what went right in the second election, um, how consent decrees in general work. Um, you know, I think that the Rules Committee in Congress needs to reach a better understanding and accommodation with an uncooperative Justice Department about what are the rightful, what's the rightful information that Congress should have access to. Because in a case like this, the Justice, Justice Department can and did stop, I think, a number of legitimate avenues of investigation which should have been pursued and which now a year later I believe and in suspect that they never fully followed. I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, that this committee and that this exercise can lead to a better understanding of Congress and the Justice Department about what information is rightfully ours. You know, the, uh, the list of people that uh, were implica implicated that have not been dealt with, the Democratic National Committee, various unions, Citizen Action, Project Vote, the National Council of Senior Citizens. These are all legitimate areas of investigation. They're legitimate areas of investigation uh, for Congress, and I do not believe have been fully followed up by the Justice Department. And um, that's my testimony. I will vote, and I will come back uh, and answer any questions that you may have at that time. Please do. You've got Thank a couple you. of minutes. Thank you. Please come back. We'll be in recess for just a few minutes until the next uh, chairman gets here. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, this hearing is an excellent idea. I want to compliment you. I'll offer a few observations based on my committee's experience with the Department of Justice lawyers as we aggressively conduct our oversight. Mr. Chairman, it's my feeling that the Justice Department is out of control. At first blush, you may not think the Committee on Resources would have too much interaction with justice. The Department of Interior is the primary agent we oversee. 
but about 50% of our full committee oversight, we end up devoting substantial time and energy arguing with what must be every lawyer in the Department of Justice about getting information we need for oversight projects. We win the arguments 99% of the time, but we face the same justice lawyers who raise the same issues that they delayed us with over the prior oversight request. I resorted to issuing numerous subpoenas to top justice officials, Janet Reno, Eric Holder, and others, so we can get documents and records that show waste, fraud, and abuse by the Clinton administration officials. In a vast majority of cases, documents are withheld, show poor judgment, or embarrass this administration. Very few valid rational exist for withholding the information that we request, but they do so over and over and over again. The generic excuse we hear all the time is the department has a long-standing policy that prohibits them from turning over information to the committee because it is or could be the subject of litigation against the United States. I just don't buy that broad excuse because nearly every bad government decision could result in a lawsuit. We could only investigate good decisions, and good decisions are short in supply recently. Here are a few examples I'm telling the subcommittee. Investigation 1.6 billion timber contract cancellation. Here's an example. We're conducting oversight on whether the Clinton-Gore administration breached a timber contract in Alaska. That decision threw 1,500 people in my state out of their high-paying family wage jobs. It exposed American taxpayers to damage at 1.6 billion. It is a typical Clinton political decision that costs jobs, costs taxpayers, and hurts the public forest. We launched an oversight review on the matter requesting that the Secretary of Agriculture provide us with certain records from the Forest Service and from his processor's office. We are trying to determine the legality of a basis for the cancellation why this administration so callously exposed the taxpayers to a contract breach claimed totaling about half the agency's annual budget. The company that held the contract has sued the government for breach of contract. So matter was in litigation. That was just as excuse to engage and delay our document request for three months. They pulled their whole team of lawyers off the case just to fight us during turning over anything to us. They claim privileges that do not apply to Congress. They failed to promptly respond to requests for information and records. I finally issued a subpoena to the Attorney General, and then she came to visit me in my office. We had a nice talk, and she basically agreed to turn over everything we wanted. I gave her assurance that we would not release certain material for a period of time. But within 24 hours, her staff reneged on giving us much of the material. The Attorney General is in partial default of the subpoena. My staff is reviewing what justice did give us. I plan to bring this matter before the committee again and deal with the default. As it stands now, however, the chief law enforcement officer of the land is not complying with the law. There's a whole host of other issues that the Department of Justice stands between the committee's search for truth and our oversight obligation under the House rules. As you know, we have an obligation under Rule 10.2b to review and study our continuing basis all laws within our jurisdiction, the organization and operation of agencies within our jurisdictions, and circumstances showing that new laws are needed. The Committee on Resources has very aggressively undertaken that responsibility. It may be why we so frequently clash with the Department of Justice. We have the case of Tucson Rod and Gun Club. Justice cancels meetings between committee investigators and the Forest Service. Justice has tried to scuttle meetings between our committee investigators and the Forest Service. They directed the service not to participate in a meeting that the committee's chief investigator had arranged and flown across the country to attend. Justice gave no consolation, no warning, no indication they would meddle in our investigation or why a public land gun range had been wrongly closed until we received a copy of their letter to the Forest Service canceling our meeting. This is not just arrogance, it's brazen arrogance grounded on long-standing policy not to allow the meeting because it involved ongoing litigation. We have the Warner Creek environmental protest. We have another investigation of events that allowed environmental protesters that are very close to this administration to illegally occupy a national forest and destroy property there for 11 months. We have a task force looking into the matter now. There was a videotape of the actual raid to remove the protesters. We request a copy of it for the committee. This tape has been shown to numerous outside parties aired for the media and has provided in criminal discovery to defendants. There was no legal authority cited for withholding the tape. I have suspended the tape and justice ultimately complied with my request. Weeks later, we have the marshal service as charged by statute serving subpoenas. Generally, we were, generally, they are helpful, except when it comes to serving officials in the Department of Justice. Several times they refused to serve justice officials. They told us their long-standing practice they would not serve justice officials because the marshals were part of the Department of Justice. I hand 
to, I had to write them a letter that spelled out their legal obligation to serve our subpoenas. They ultimately changed their long-standing practice. The FBI briefing in U.S. territories. We took a delegation of House members to the territories of the Pacific last year. I arranged briefings for our delegation with all the federal bureaus and agencies. Every agency that was invited, except for the FBI, showed up for the briefings. I walked down to the FBI office, office to remind them they were supposed to send a representative to the media to discuss their issues. I've never been faced with such per personal arrogance by a federal agency official. This gentleman fatly, fatly refused to join our meeting. I did receive an apology letter from the director, but again, some unwritten, long-standing policy was cited by the FBI as a reason for failure for the agent to even attend our meeting. The Department of Policies and Employees receiving payments from outside sources. A DOE and a Department of Energy employee received $350,000 each from an outfit called the Project and Government Oversight, or so-called watchdog group. This group, external to the government, that paid the government employees that have been trying to fix the oil royalty problem for years from within the bureaucracy. I've never heard such a thing before. An outside group with an agenda paid a government employee a third of a million dollars each because they worked to further their agenda. We have document requests and issue subpoenas for records to the Department of Interior and again and again were met with just the Department objections because the Interior IG was conducting a criminal investigation on the matter of long-standing policy supposedly to prevent them from turning over much information to the committee investigators. We're still fighting this one. Mr. Chairman, I can go on. We have an additional six other investigations right now. But let me close by saying I would be happy to work with you on rule change to eliminate this problem with the Department of Justice. They are preventing this Congress, my committee, and others' committees from the oversight which we are charged to do. We are required to do so under the Constitution and rules of the House. We must bring a halt to the stonewalling by this administration. I have served in six administrations that I have been in the Congress, and this is the worst of all that I have ever been faced with. They do not cooperate. They ignore the constitutional law. They ignore the Congress. In fact, thumb their nose to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, Mr. Burton, Indiana. Let me uh, preface my remarks by saying I, I, I apologize for having such a lengthy report. It's actually much longer than my statement is going to be, and I'm going to submit that for the record if it's all right, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but I wanted to comment briefly on an article that was in the Washington Post this morning on the front page. In the last paragraph said, uh, meanwhile, the FBI's National Security Division balked at passing along intelligence information to the Justice Department Task Force investigating the 1996 campaign fundraising. This intransigence, this is according to the IG over there at the uh, Justice Department, this intransigence, according to the report, ultimately stymied key, a key criminal investigation. I, I, I don't know uh, for sure why uh, Director Louis Free and his subordinates at the FBI might have not have given all the information to the Justice Department, but I have a suspicion. And the suspicion is that they were afraid that some of the very important issues that they were investigating relating to national security and other issues might be leaked by the Justice Department itself to people in the White House who may have been involved. And for that reason, I think uh, the FBI, in, in, in many cases, is, is, is very concerned about the security of their investigation. And I want to tell you personally, and I, I can't speak for my colleagues, but Louis Free, I've worked uh, with him now for about three years, and I think Louis Free is doing his dead-level best to be a good director at the FBI. And Chuck LaBella, who was the head of the task force uh, after, uh, uh, I think he was a second or third fellow in, head of the task force, I am convinced that he was trying to do the best job. Both of them appeared before my committee and suggested that there should have been an independent counsel, according to them, appointed to investigate the entire finan uh, the campaign contribution scandal. And the Justice Department and Janet Reno in particular, the Attorney General, would not adhere to what they thought the law required. And we were talking not only about Mr. LaBella, who headed the task force, Mr. Free, who's the FBI director, but also Mr. DeSarno, who was the agent in charge of the investigation for the FBI. And so I, I would just like to say from my experience that uh, uh, Louis Free, the director of the FBI, and Chuck LaBella, the head of the task force, uh, did their dead level best to uh, provide uh, uh, the kind of investigation that this country would require. And the big problem as far as that campaign finance investigation was and is Janet Reno and the Justice Department. Now, with that, I'll go into my prepared statement, and I, I, I hope that you'll bear with me because it's, it's quite lengthy. 
Shortly after I became chairman of the Committee on Government Reform, uh, as you know, I began an investigation of campaign fundraising irregularities. Today, I'll not go into the findings of that investigation, but instead I'll share some of my insights into how the Justice Department has failed to do its job and how the Attorney General, Janet Reno, and her political appointees have placed roadblocks in front of my committee. And you've heard other committee chairmen talk about the stonewalling. I want to tell you, it is unbelievable. What began as an inquiry into illegal campaign fundraising has now become, in part, oversight of the Justice Department's failure to do the business of the American people. Before I summarize my findings, I would like to note my concern over the death or the end of the independent counsel law. The independent counsel law was not perfect. It had its flaws. But we have far more serious problems now that it has expired. What happens when an attorney general must investigate her boss, the president of the United States, or a political party? Remember in the campaign fundraising scandal, the main targets were not only high-ranking government officials, but also the people who ran a political party. The party itself was directly implicated, the Democrat Party. And the attorney general's professional career was primarily as an elected official of the Democrat Party. There couldn't be a clear of interest and that is precisely what FBI Director Louis Free and Chief Prosecutor LaBella told the Attorney General. They told her in no uncertain terms there should be an, a, an independent counsel. In my view, there is no way that the head of the Justice Department can investigate her boss and her political party and maintain the confidence of the American people. By conducting what has clearly been a failed investigation, Janet Reno further eroded the people's respect for the Department of Justice, and in my view, justice itself. In my view, this is the Attorney General's legacy. Through incompetence and partisan zeal, she has managed to bring the Justice Department to shame and disrepute. Confidence in the Department's ability to work for the American people is at an all-time low, and my colleagues have told you the same thing. And I haven't talked to any of them about this. In the next few weeks, I will introduce legislation to create a bipartisan panel to choose a pool of qualified individuals who can be called upon to serve as Justice Department special prosecutors. This process will avoid the constitutional problems of the independent counsel law, but it will permit the ind individuals from outside the administration to supervise sensitive Justice Department investigations. In other words, it will eliminate the possibility that an attorney general can investigate her boss or protect her boss, the president. Now let me summarize my concerns with the Justice Department and Attorney General Reno. And before I start, though, let me play a tape, and I hope my colleagues will, can see this tape. I think it's a very good introduction as to how the uh, Justice Department operates. This is Mr. Chuck LaBella, who is the task force uh, uh, head uh, uh, of the investigation. charged with the responsibility of investigating the campaign finance scandal. Chuck LaBella was the head of the task force appointed by the Attorney General for that job. And Mr. LaBella wanted to cooperate and work with us. I called him and asked him to return my call. And one of the chief lieutenants of Janet Reno called him right after I called saying, don't talk to Dan Burton under any circumstances. Now, that is obstruction of justice as far as I'm concerned because we speak for the people in the Congress, and we were conducting an investigation, and the Justice Department was deliberately trying to keep us from talking to Mr. LaBella. Now, 
I want to cite some examples of why I'm very concerned. First, I am well aware that the Department obstructed investigations prior to my tenure as chairman of the Government Reform Committee. At the beginning of the Clinton administration, the de facto head of the Justice Department, Mr. Webb Hubble, who was convicted and went to jail, had boxes of whitewater evidence in his basement while his staff was trying to decide what to do with criminal referrals that depended on the very evidence that Hubble was withholding. When Michael Dukakis said that a fish rots from the head down, he must have had Janet Reno's Justice Department in mind. Second, throughout Chairman Klinger's tenure, the Justice Department repeatedly stonewalled him. The Travelgate investigation was maintained as an open case even after a criminal trial completely exonerated Travel Office Director Billy Dale. They still wouldn't give Congress information because they said it was an open case and he'd been exonerated. These delays needlessly hampered Chairman Klinger's efforts. In fact, that is a recurring pattern. The department keeps investigations open long after it has stopped doing any work and then tells Congress that it can't cooperate because the investigation is ongoing. And I believe, I believe there are a number of cases right now that are being held open that they're ready to close simply because they don't want members of Congress to have access to information regarding those investigations. Third. When Chuck LaBella and Louis Free recommended the appointment of an independent counsel, Janet Reno took the political low road. She sided with her boss and her party and her political operatives. To this day, I imagine that she doesn't even care about the damage that decision has caused to the department's rec reputation. I have read parts of the Free and LaBella memos myself, and I can tell you that what they said was really troubling. Janet Reno's political staff was using a higher threshold for senior White House political staff than for other citizens. This is what Mr. LaBella said, and I, I think I'm quoting him pretty accurately. The task force has commenced criminal investigations of non-covered persons based only on a wisp, of, a wisp of information. They started investigations when there was just a wisp of information on people that weren't really important. He continued by noting that the threshold was much, much higher for Clinton administ administration political appointees. So they had one standard for people that weren't high in the Clinton administration and another for the Clinton administration officials themselves. It's also clear that investigations would have commenced much earlier if the people under scrutiny were not White House officials. Again, here's what LaBella said. If these allegations involve anyone other than blank, and you can imagine who he's talking about, if these allegations involved anyone other than blank, an appropriate investigation would have commenced months ago without hesitation. I want you to keep Mr. LaBella's concerns on this point in mind in a few minutes when I talk about how Janet Reno's politicos allowed Charlie Tree a major opportunity to destroy evidence. They let Charlie Tree destroy evidence when they refused to authorize a search warrant, even though they had evidence that his employees was destroying documents. In addition, the department went through legal contortions to avoid moving forward on investigating those at the highest levels. Again, here's what LaBella actually said in his memo. The contortions, listen to this, the contortions that the department has gone through to avoid investigating these allegations are important. So he's saying the Justice Department went through contortions to avoid the law and avoid investigating. As I've said before, I am deeply, deeply troubled by the use of the double standard with which the political colleagues of the Attorney General uh, are getting the benefit of more lenient uh, 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 investigations. Let's not beat around the bush here. Taken as a whole, these are allegations of corruption. When you fail to investigate members of your own political party, or when you apply different standards to administration officials than to other citizens, and when you go through contortions, as Mr. LaBella said, to avoid investigating members of your party, then you're behaving corruptly. And I say that of the Attorney General, and that's why I've called for her resignation in the past. LaBella and Free concluded that an independent counsel was necessary before our committee. In return, Attorney General Reno's political staff overruled and belittled them, and they continue to belittle Mr. Free to this day. Even though all agreed he was the most qualified candidate, Chuck, La now, this is extremely important, even though all agreed that he was the most qualified candidate, Chuck LaBella, who was the task force chief, was even denied the U.S. attorney position in, in San Diego. 
Janet Reno overruled Free and LaBella and continued giving preferential treatment to her political allies. He was in line to be the U.S. attorney in San Diego, and because he wrote that memo and because he testified before our committee, they passed over him to a subordinate and gave them the attorney general. That's a kind of that's a kind of uh, uh, threat that they hold over people's heads. If you don't go along, you won't you won't get the get what uh, you, you're entitled to. Although Washington is a town where the president debates the meaning of the word is, where I come from, failure to apply the law even-handedly and giving your political allies special treatment is corruption. Fourth, speaking of corruption, over a year ago, we gave information to the Justice Department about, about a friend of the Attorney General's, one of her friends. This information alleges that the Attorney General's friend illegally obtained sensitive classified information from the Justice Department. According to information received by the committee, this friend of the Attorney General even suggested paying money to a Justice Department employee who helped obtain some of the illegal information. One document we have says that the person the author talked to confirmed that Steele Hector was hired due to the relationship with the Attorney General. Steele Hector is a big Miami law firm where Attorney General once worked. The memo goes on to point out that Reno and the sister of the lawyer hired are good friends. Other documents indicate that the department changed the policy related to release of information so that this person could help her client. This policy change, according to one memo obtained by the committee, was made personally by the Attorney General. Still another document talks about a confidential and reliable source within the Justice Department. And still another memo obtained by the committee states that the confidential source within the department would not come forward publicly due to her pension that may be at risk if she was exposed. She added an offer that may have been made as to severance pay by the client if that resulted. The she here is a lawyer who is a friend of the Attorney General. Janet Reno has steadfastly refused to investigate her friend. Again, I believe this is corruption. Fifth, on a related note, Janet Reno's political appointees dropped the ball completely when it came to prosecuting a Democratic fundraiser who raised illegal campaign money in Venezuela. To make matters worse, her political appointees have interfered with our investigation of this matter. Last winter, we asked, uh, we asked, a gen uh, we asked, pardon me, I'm missing a page of my testimony here. Thank you. Last winter, we asked the Justice Department to provide information for this investigation on DEA policies relating to computer access. For six months, six months, a Justice Department official refused to provide this information, claiming the DEA would not provide it to him. Just two days ago, we found out that the DEA had never been informed that the committee wanted this information. As soon as the DEA found out about the committee's request, they worked to give us an answer. But in the meantime, the Justice Department kept the committee from finding out critical information for six months. Is it a coincidence that this information relates to our investigation of a Democratic fundraiser from Miami? And I want to tell you, regarding this, uh, this uh, campaign money in Venezuela, the district attorney in New York, a Democrat, uh, contacted the Justice Department and thought that this should be uh, investigated, this man should be prosecuted, and that it, there should be a complete and thorough investigation of this. And they, the Justice Department, after, and, and this is a Democrat, Mr. Morgenthau, after he had contacted the Justice Department, they let the statute run out on that so that they couldn't pursue it. Six, let's talk about the department's handling of the Charlie Tree investigation. Campaign task force investigators knew that Tree's bookkeeper was destroying documents relating to Tree. The FBI saw people that worked for Tree destroying documents, and he was under investigation. They asked the Justice Department for a search warrant. FBI agents were even sent to Little Rock to execute the search warrant, and Janet Reno's hand-picked political advisors turned down the search warrant request, even though they knew documents were being destroyed. Months went by before the search took place, and I just wonder if the Attorney General is proud of the head start that she gave Mr. Tree, because it gave him and his colleagues a lot of time to destroy very valuable documents that were relevant to the investigation. It's hard to know sometimes whose interest she's really representing. Speaking of Charlie Tree, it's impossible to leave out the slap on the wrist that the Justice Department 
has agreed to give both Charlie Tree and John Wong. The department has promised them no prison time at all, maybe some community service time, but no prison time. The Justice Department even proposed, promised to give John Wong back his voting rights. When U.S. attorneys outside of Washington, D.C. have prosecuted conduit contributors recently, they have managed to get prison time or at the very least home incarceration. Why the kid gloves treatment for presidential friends like Mr. Wong and Mr. Tree? And Mr. Wong and Mr. Tree were involved in so many of the conduit contributions that we're aware of. Much of that money that came to the Democrat National Committee was returned, had John Wong's name all over it, and Charlie Tree was a solicitor, and nothing but community service time, while people who did a lot less were prosecuted. Eighth, I also wonder what happened to the Attorney General's promised investigation of leaks within the department. I have yet to hear her condemn those of her employees who leaked material damaging to the campaign finance investigation. I intend to ask for all records relating to these so-called investigations. When the White House accused independent counsel Starr of leaks, the Justice Department went to work investigating him vigorously. When the Attorney General's political people run interference for the administration, the department is noticeably silent. This Justice Department investigates if, there's a, if there is political benefit, but it's silent when real crimes have been committed. Ninth, turning to national security, it was the Attorney General's political staff who reviewed search warrant requests for, for records at Los Alamos, where all of our nuclear secrets were given to the Communist Chinese. It appears that her political people weren't really all that concerned with national security. The FBI tried to get permission for wiretaps on Win Ho Lee three times. He's the major suspect of the espionage. They wanted to find out if he was passing information to the Communist Chinese that would endanger the security of every man, woman, and child in this country. The Justice Department was turned down not once, but three times on that search warrant and that wiretap. And to my knowledge, that's the first time in history where espionage has been alleged that the Justice Department has denied the FBI search warrants and wiretaps. Tenth, one of the greatest hurdles facing the committee is the routine failure by the department to produce documents in a timely manner. Earlier I mentioned a specific example involving DEA documents. The excuses are endless, and the department hides behind legally unsupportable readings of the federal rules of criminal procedure. At all times, the department has behaved as though it was defense counsel for the President of the United States and not a servant of the Constitution and the American people. Eleventh, when law and politics collide, the political appointees at the Justice Department seem to ignore the law. Take, for instance, an anecdote from the recent Bob Woodward book. In May of 1996, White House counsel Jack Quinn was voted in contempt of Congress by my committee for a failure to turn over subpoenaed documents. This is what Mr. Woodward says in his book. Quote, Quinn was confident he wouldn't be sent to jail if we held him in contempt. Lawyers in the Justice Department had assured him they would not prosecute even if the full House of Representatives cited him for contempt. That's collusion with the White House. How many layers of corruption does this statement reveal? First, Justice Department lawyers decided they would simply ignore the law, that they would do a favor for the president's lawyer. Then they told Jack Quinn what they had already decided. I'll bet that there are a lot of criminal defendants and defense attorneys who would like that sort of help from the Justice Department. Twelfth, in August of 1998, committee investigators interviewed Jack Ho. Jack Ho helped one of Charlie Tree's associates funnel $25,000 in foreign money to the DNC. In the course of interviewing Ho, committee staff learned that Ho had never been contacted by the Justice Department. After the committee informed the Justice Department of Ho's existence, the department scrambled to interview him. Mr. Ho later told the committee that in the course of his Justice Department interview, investigators told him that he did not have to cooperate with Congress and our committee. Not only does the Justice Department obstruct us, the Attorney General's people have gone out of their way to tell others not to cooperate. Thirteenth, when we asked to talk to lawyers at the department who could shed some light on why the Attorney General's advisors decided to let the statute of limitations expire on Florida fundraiser Charles Entriago, we were given a stiff arm. Five years ago, when Democrat Chairman Dingell Wanted to, talk to, wanted to talk to the same types of lawyers, he was given full access. Once again, 
just like the flip-flop over supporting and then opposing the independent counsel statute and the use of different standards for top White House officials, I wonder why the Attorney General makes decisions to benefit Democrats and then changes her policies or mind when she's investigating Democrats. Janet Run Reno has run the most politicized Justice Department since the Teapot Dome scandal of the 1920s. This department, in my opinion, might even be worse. The legacy she will leave is one of public cynicism and prof professional frustration. There have been times that even the FBI hasn't been able to trust the Attorney General's political staff, and I submit to you that may be why you read what you read in the Washington Post this morning. I, for one, think there should be a major house cleaning and that someone of the stature of FBI director or independent or, or the, uh, the counsel of uh, Mr. Uh, LaBella, I think they both are men of stature, should be put in charge of the department to restore the integrity that has been lost over the last six years. And for me, it couldn't happen a minute too soon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, gentlemen. It is my understanding that Mr. Kenjorski has a time concern and Mr. Hyde, to, with his typical grace, has agreed to sit back and let him take uh, the next spot. Thank you, Mr. Hyde. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I am pleased to uh, respond to the request of the chairman to testify on what I was led to uh, understand was a cooperative comedy and confrontation in the nature of uh, oversight of the executive branch. Having sat through uh, some of the last testimony, I think we could at least strike two of those words. Mr. Chairman, uh, I've had the occasion over the 15 years of my service in Congress to observe oversight operations of the various committees of the House. First, may I say, uh, by definition, clearly the 106th Congress has been the most, most torturous. Uh, probably for several reasons that I think I can imagine and imagine the full committee can imagine. Uh, we have now elevated ourselves to uh, uh, contest and uh, political advantage to the extent that we have reached out and used every arm of uh, government and every arm of our institution and probably are in some instances willing to prostitute the Constitution that we took an oath in office to. I think that's unfortunate. I don't uh, hang that on the majority or the minority singularly. It probably is a tit for tat. As a matter of fact, last week, uh, traveling across America, I had the occasion to sp send some, spend some time to deliberate. And it struck me that uh, in most instances in the past, the Congress has act, acted as a representative of the people to strike high public policy and hold most things that we do in the consideration of what would be best in the nature of public policy. Today, I dare say that regardless of what proposition is put forth by either side of the aisle, the other side of the aisle immediately says no, responds, and puts a, con a contrary position in place, sometimes not even consistent with their own basic philosophy or ide ideology, simply as a reactive uh, step in this high emotional climate that we find ourselves in. It seems to me the important thing is to see how we can step back and do the people's business. And quite frankly, I want to take two minutes to respond to the prior testimony of Mr. Burton. I've had the occasion to serve on Mr. Burton's committee through the entire 105th and 106th Congress. I've got to tell you that I have never experienced a, uh, a determination by the majority or the chairman of that committee to arrive at a conclusion and then attempt to find the facts. Uh, it's rather uh, astounding, to tell you the truth, and I understand his frustration. He didn't find the facts. He didn't, he, he didn't get to the ultimate goal that he wanted to attain, and it drove great frustration. But it also destroyed the comedy, the cooperation of that committee to a large extent, that at this point I'm not sure that the Oversight Committee of the House of Representatives, under pres as presently constituted, can really carry on any oversight at all with any faith on either side of the aisle that we're pursuing a public policy end for the good of the people, as opposed to the benefit of political partisanship. I, 
I, I think that's very unfortunate. And uh, in, in light of that, I looked back and I tried to come up with some key rules. And I found that a good former colleague of ours, Dennis Eckert of Ohio, had four, four rules they tried to apply. And the rules were very simple. One, do your homework and be properly prepared knowing all of the facts. Before we charge a committee to make an investigation or write off into a challenge, we should make ourselves aware of all the facts available. Secondly, the facts should determine the agenda. Do not let the political agenda drive the facts. Clearly, rule number two was the, 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 the most grievously violated rule in the, in the investigation of campaign finance reform. There was a determination to fit those facts into a political agenda, regardless of what the facts indicated. Thirdly, carefully guard the integrity and the cr credibility of the investigation. A congressional investigation may be a political event, but it cannot be partisan. I, I think anyone, uh, as impartial as we could all attempt to be or objective as we could attempt to be, would have to say that clearly the investigation is carried on by the Oversight Committee over the last year has been probably as partisan as any investigation we've ever seen, and as a result, colored the entire investigation lost the cooperation of the minority and, quite frankly, I think in some instances, instances uh, embarrassed some of the members of the majority. Four, respect the process and participants. Keep in mind that when all is said and done, the public confidence and credibility of your report is directly related to the perception that everyone had their fair day in the hearing room. That was so clearly not done. Uh, there was a, a refusal to allow witnesses that would have established uh, facts that were being chased down that didn't exist, uh, mis uh, mis uh, uh, construction of what facts were put out on the table or narrowly channeling those facts to, a, to make appearances or allow the drawing of conclusions that weren't warranted. Uh, it was an unfortunate experience, I think partially I've learned one uh, premise. Never will I sit on a committee of the House of Representatives and vote the subpoena power to a chairman without a vote of the committee. I saw that happen in many instances to uh, grave damage of private American citizens. A Chinese professor, Chinese American professor, Georgetown University, had his entire life disrupted because uh, uh, the committee was so anxious to issue a subpoena, he didn't find out it was the wrong name and the wrong person, and really, uh, caused an unusual disturbance in the gentleman's life. Uh, a, 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 exercising probably the most uh, extraordinary power of government, the subpoena, where we cast aside all protections of in individuals, subject them to the full might of this great government and this great Congress, and not to take all the precautions necessary to protect their rights, and then to limit their exposures. I, I think along those lines, uh, I would contrast some hearings that I have had, but I don't want to uh, uh, necessarily make that comparison. All I will say is that it, it strikes me that the committee that I'm talking about in the investigation that Mr. Burton has just testified to ultimately issued 758 subpoenas, 684 for documents and 74 for witnesses. We obtained more than a million and a half pages of documents from the executive branch. I wasn't certain that there were that many people down there that knew how to write. But apparently uh, they filled a, hundred and, or a million and a half pages and they gave them to this committee. But I can tell you, I don't think there was anybody on that committee that knew enough, and had enough time to read them. So uh, what we did was caused great exacerbation and great appearance of what the goal was make it appear that this administration or this Justice Department were engaged in some scandal or corrupt activity, when in fact, I'm not certain what the legislative purpose of the investigation was ultimately for. No legislation or recommendation for campaign finance reform has come out of it. No effort was defined in the beginning that that's what the intention of the committee was. The investigations that were carried on by our committee were rather superficial and, and and not terribly professionally performed. And, and there were, in the meantime, other uh, 
properly and legally constituted structures and institutions of this government that we're carrying on for prosecution purposes these very investigations. And ultimately, it was my conclusion that those of us who served, whether in the majority or in the minority on that committee, were embarrassed for our service because we appeared to the American people to be zealots, uh, not possessed of all the facts and information, and certainly not sensitive to the rights and responsibilities of the witnesses and the people being investigated and to the processes of the House of Representatives. I think this institution suffered greatly as a result. On that basis, I'd recommend this committee really seriously look into the reforming of Rule 11 of the House in regard to the issuance of subpoenas, and only under uh, a, a vote of the entire House of Representatives ever in power, a chairman again, to issue subpoenas solely on his own power. And when that be done, only on a single basis, if that's essential. And I, to my own uh, knowledge, uh, uh, over the last 15 years I've served here, I've never seen any, a real need for that. I think this all came about because it was a driving force. I've sat here for the last six years in Congress and watched something start out called Whitewater that possessed the attention of the Banking Committee for more than 40 days. And then when the potato didn't seem to have any more heat in it and it couldn't be tossed around, that closed down with a whimper and nothing came of it. And then we moved over to the Oversight Committee and then there was Filegate and nothing ever came of Filegate. Then there was Travelgate and nothing ever came of Travelgate. And then there was Campaign Finance Reform and nothing ever came of Finance Reform. Ah, uh, we did have a uh, special counsel that discovered a, a grave indiscretion of the President of the United States involving his personal life, and that did ultimately uh, get resolved. Uh, but it had nothing to do with the official duties of the President, nor any corrupt act of an Attorney General or any Cabinet officer of the President of this United States. And uh, I don't like to make comparisons of uh, one administration to the other, because I don't think that's our role. But anyone sit here before this committee of Congress and assert that this administration or this Justice Department is the most corrupt that ever existed or comparing it to Teapot and Pot Dome only speaks to a lack of historical perspective on the part of the witnesses says that. Anyone that knows uh, Janet Reno may disagree with her judgments, but I don't think they have any right to attack her integrity or disagree with that integrity, and I on occasion have taken exception to some of her judgments. As a result of uh, the successful prosecutions, none, to my knowledge, out of Whitewater, Filegate, Travelgate, or campaign finance reform have moved into the office of the President or anything directly related to the President or Vice President of the United States or any of their immediate appointees, and particularly nothing touching on their official function. These are all peripherally side issues. Some people got caught in making bad mortgages that were friends of the president in, uh, in uh, Arkansas and had no direct relationship to him and were really not the products, nor should they have ultimately been uh, the, the objects of the investigation, but they did suffer from it. But quite frankly, having gone through, through six and a half years of torturous investigation, restrictions on the office of the president, and I think uh, a disturbing element that this will be the continuing result future activities and politics in the United States. Six and a half years, I, I, it's almost like the insane man that's been examined by a psychiatrist and uh, determined to be sane. He's about the only one of us that can assert his sanity. Uh, this administration, having been so thoroughly investigated for six and a half years, can literally represent that it is one of the least corrupt administrations in the history of the United States, not the most. I know that perception will not change because people have gathered and the word scandal corruption so willingly used by Mr. Burton, and I respect the fact that my good friend Dan is not a lawyer, but he <laughs> certainly does jump off to conclusions without facts and without logical analysis to justify those conclusions. And I would just temper him on that, not that you have to be a lawyer to be a chairman of this committee. But I think we should all be cautious before we label an American citizen or an official of this government as, as having committed a crime attacking their personal integrity unless we have absolutely the facts sufficient to uh, cause a conviction 
on that charge. And I don't think they exist. And if they do exist, certainly the chairman has not brought them forward and forward them on to any proper institution to proceed with the legal processes that our laws allow. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I would like to say that um, I think there is a role for oversight. I think it's one of our biggest roles. I think it's one of the greatest failings of this Congress. We always want to uh, jump to the opportunity to let's pass a law to solve all problems. But few of us are willing to do the detailed and deep work to do the study and the analysis of how laws are acting and how they're being carried out and how our officials are carrying out. And I think it would be very important, it is very important for this committee to step back for a moment and say let's have some cooperation, some comedy, and let's exercise proper congressional oversight of the executive branch of government and help make this government work more efficiently and more effectively, not for the Republicans, not for the Democrats, but for the people we represent, the American people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ken Joyce. I understand you have some time constraints. Would you respond to some written questions for us? Absolutely. Mr. Thank you very much. We'll do that. Mr. Hyde? Mr. Chairman, while Mr. Hyde's coming up, uh, during the question and answer period, may I make some responses? I don't think we need to debate this. Let's try and move forward on the rules issues. Mr. Hyde, Hi, proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's been a fascinating morning. I think it's been an interesting morning. Um, very briefly, uh, Mr. Kanjorski had some very salient points. You ought to let the facts drive investigations. But how do you get the facts? If you get stonewalled, Stonewalling isn't so bad. Then you can find a way to dig under it or go around it. But it's when they aggressively obstruct that it becomes even tougher. So getting the facts is the predicate to an investigation, I agree. But trying to get the facts out of this administration is some trick. Um, secondly, I heard Mr. Kanjorski talk about the pursuit of the president on his some private conduct. Judge Susan Weber Wright did not find him in contempt on any private conduct. That was overt conduct. Uh, we did not proceed against him uh, uh, for any private conduct, but for perjury, obstruction of justice, uh, and those were overt felonies, not private conduct. That is the ongoing spin, and it still is spinning, but it isn't so. Um, I will eschew my preliminary remarks. Uh, we all know how important oversight is. Actually, it's, it, it is an important function of Congress. We cannot legislate unless we do it based on information. Again, Mr. Panjorski is Eb Ken, Pen, Panjorski. Kanjorski, forgive me, it's Paul Kanjorski, uh, is quite correct. We need information, and if we can't get it from the agencies that who possess it, we are frustrated. We cannot do our job. So it is very important. Now, it is my opinion, and I've been here a few years, that the Department of Justice uh, doesn't view congressional oversight with that benign a view. Uh, on the contrary, they've made a regular practice of delaying, ignoring, or rejecting legitimate congressional requests for information. I experienced this most dramatically last Congress when the committee held oversight hearings to examine the Department of Justice's handling of the campaign finance investigation. Members of the committee were qu quite simply denied answers to nearly every question that was asked. Within a few days, some of the information we sought was made available to the press and became common knowledge, but it was never officially available for the committee and the Congress. Several members of the committee were promised prompt and complete answers in writing to several other questions that the Attorney General could not answer. And despite repeated requests, follow-up, and demands for the information, the Department took more than five months to even respond to some of our questions. Most of these responses were inadequate and failed to answer the questions posed. Now, the Department has been increasingly aggressive in lobbying against legislation that it opposes. I believe the Department has often crossed the fine line between offering its advice and consultation on legislation when requested 
and actively lobbying against the legislation. In the summer of 97, I proposed to amend the Commerce, Justice, and State Appropriations Bill with a provision that would allow any citizen, any citizen who was criminally prosecuted but found innocent, to recover attorney's fees where the judge determined that the government acted frivolously, vexatiously, or in bad faith. That is a simple proposal. If you're prosecuted in bad faith, you should at least have the opportunity to recover your financial costs. The Department of Justice fought strenuously against my proposal and vowed to convince the President to veto the funding bill, the whole bill, if my provision were a part of it. That struck me as odd. I can understand why a federal prosecutor who may have acted unscrupulously would oppose the provision, but how could the department, this institution of government, oppose a provision aimed at preventing the government from acting frivolously, vexatiously, or in bad faith in a prosecution that could wrongfully deprive a citizen of his liberty or even his life? They didn't just oppose it. They pulled out all the stops. Deputy Attorney General Eric Holder called the provision drastic legislation and claimed that people like John Gotti, John Hinckley, and John DeLorean could wind up with big taxpayer checks. He went on to say it will handcuff prosecutors and could cost the taxpayers a fortune in high-stakes payoffs to America's most wanted. From the sound of Mr. Holder's rhetoric, this provision meant the end of the criminal justice system as we know it. Nonetheless, in November of 97, the House passed the provision by a bipartisan vote of 340 to 84, and the President signed the bill. Soon after the bill went into effect, the acting assistant attorney general for the criminal division and the deputy attorney general sent a memo to all U.S. attorneys explaining the new provision and essentially explaining how to undermine this new law. We've had similar experiences with legislation requiring federal prosecutors to comply with state and federal court ethics rules and reforming our civil asset forfeiture laws. The last provision recently passed in the House by a vote of 375 to 45, but we face an uphill battle in the Senate where the department has focused its lobbying efforts. I think we all feel the department should spend more time responding to requests for information and less time in active opposition to our legislation. The department has talked a great deal about how important congressional oversight is, but as you've heard today, um, that's all wind up and no pitch. Even more disturbing, the Department of Justice seems to have become a model of noncompliance with congressional oversight. As some of the earlier testimony today indicated, in some cases the department has stepped into disputes and recommended against compliance with congressional requests to other departments or agencies in the executive branch. Such aggressiveness and non-cooperation could be interpreted as political or partisan, but I believe the problem is one of attitude and goes much deeper. The department often acts as though it is above the law, especially where congressional oversight is concerned. On many occasions, the department quotes its internal policies and practices as reasons for not complying with legitimate oversight requests. They have defended their recalcitrance with tortured interpretations of Rule 6E or even novel claims of governmental privileges. Each of the chairmen here today is familiar with the department's often stated claim that compliance with oversight requests would interfere with an ongoing criminal investigation. In many cases, there is nothing, there is no amount of accommodation the committee can propose to overcome that objection. As you decide whether the department has considered itself above congressional oversight, please don't take my word for it. I wouldn't expect that. Listen to what the department itself has said. Michael Shaheen, who headed the department's Office of Professional Responsibility from its inception in 1973 to 1997, said, and I quote, there is no other department that is viewed with comparable terror or fear because there is no other department that by itself 
can put you in jail or take your life, liberty, or property from you. The department has the FBI and other agencies. It has become a leviathan in the minds of a lot of people because it is so big and imponderable. I think it is correct to say that no outsider is capable of oversight, close quote. That's an incredible statement. The man who is responsible for ensuring that the department lawyers act ethically and responsibly, concluding the department is just too powerful to be accountable to outsiders, that is Congress and the courts. This wasn't a boast, it was made in good faith and with good intention, but that only makes it more incredible. The cold hard truth is this has become a way of thinking in the department. In short, congressional requests, legitimate requests for information are too often dismissed or ignored. We in the House are held accountable every two years. That is one of the primary reasons we must take seriously our responsibility to oversee those who think they're not accountable. One of the reasons I ran for Congress, one of the reasons I studied and practiced law to become a lawyer, was to try and remedy injustice wherever I could. Everyone is entitled to their due. Justice means not being cheated, not being defrauded, and it sure means not being pushed around. I've come to learn some people do get pushed around, and even by their government. I was very late in coming to that realization, but I learned that people in government exercising enormous power are human beings, and like everyone else, capable of error and capable certainly of arrogance. Power is the ultimate aphrodisiac, Henry Kissinger said. These people who exercise this power, and when it's the government, it's almost limitless, are capable of hubris, they're capable of overreaching, and on very infrequent occasions, they push people around. And so when such injustice happens, it's doubly frustrating when citizens have no other place to turn. If the government, your last resort is your oppressor, you have no remedy. This is especially true of the Department of Justice, which can take your life, take your liberty, take your property. The Department of Justice employs more than 120,000 people and has an annual budget in excess of $18 billion. That's five times the budget for the entire federal judiciary and more than seven times the amount appropriated for the Congress, both the House and the Senate. We appropriated that money. We have empowered the Department, and it's our responsibility to ensure the department is accountable to the public, the same group we are responsible for and to, so are they. That accountability can only come through our oversight. In closing, I want to say I strongly support the Department of Justice and its mission. I strongly support and admire and respect the thousands of employees who do their work and do it well and are underpaid and overworked. I deeply respect the work they do. That's why I feel so strongly about the department complying with legitimate, legitimate congressional requests. I'm afraid when the department loses its credibility with this Congress and the American people, as I'm afraid the whole government is losing its credibility, uh, we are in serious trouble. I don't think we can be indifferent to this, and we mustn't let it continue, and I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hyde. Um, we'll just have a few questions from the panel, and then Mr. Frank will come and, and testify next. Mr. Hyde, in Cobell versus Babbitt, the class action suit revolving around the Indian trust funds, the judge Lambeth, Lamberth noted that on many occasions he took the Department of Justice's word during the discussions, and at the end he said, most shocking, he said, is that the court's trust in the Justice Department was misplaced. They had lied to him. What's the remedy? The remedy is having people who run the Justice Department take sa impose sanctions on any one of their employees who lies, especially to a federal judge in a court proceeding. That ought to be beyond toleration, and uh, the Attorney General ought to act on it promptly. If the Attorney General refuses to act on something like that, um, 
that's something I think that would call for an intense discussion between the Appropriations Committee and the uh, Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Hoekstra, you on a couple of occasions needed to come to get special rules provided for your investigation. Um, is there anything that you would like to suggest might be changes in the rules so that you don't have to come back to the Rules Committee just to complete an investigation? Well, the, uh, the one that I mentioned in the testimony was that uh, subcommittee or that committee chairman would have the, the deposition, the sub subpoena authority uh, in the rules at the beginning of the year. Uh, we found uh, very much to the credit of the Rules Committee and the, the House that as we did our investigation of the Teamsters, that prior to getting <clears throat> prior to getting the special rules in place and getting them approved by the House, uh, we had to build up a, uh, a track record of why they were necessary. Well, you know, you start an investigation, a special investigation. You have to hire staff. You have to get the you know you get the funds. You have to hire staff. You begin the work, uh, and then to build the track record. Uh, it means that you are going through a three to six month process uh, before you could actually uh, create the compelling case for why those rules were necessary. And I believe that uh, you know those are rules that you can give uh, and should be given immediately if you expect an oversight subcommittee uh, to be effective. The other rule that I think that the, the Rules Committee should take a look at is the rule that uh, or the process where if someone is held in contempt of Congress, uh, the Senate, uh, I believe, uh, has a process in place where the Senate then will take that through the courts. Uh, the House will rely on the Justice Department to put that through or to follow our contempt uh, citation. Uh, I think the House ought to seriously consider taking a look at the Senate provision and seeing if that is a more appropriate way of doing it, that if we believe that someone has acted in contempt of the House, we should take the responsibility for then moving that through the courts and not moving it somewhere else into the executive branch and hope that they agree with us and that they will aggressively uh, pursue it. So I think those are two changes that we should take a look at. Uh, Mr. Burton, I think you, uh, you also had problems with rules changes in your investigation, did you not? Well, I think we asked for a deposition authority, and we were granted that. Uh, I think that that's uh, extremely important when you're conducting any kind of an investigation. I think the Teamster investigation, our investigation, uh, required that, and uh, uh, I'm not so sure that that shouldn't be a rules change that uh, allows uh, any committee that's exercising oversight shouldn't be able to do the same thing. May I, may I just sure. say one more thing real quickly? I, I, I don't want to get into a, a discussion or debate, but the, 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 the statement I made is based upon bank records and facts. And uh, uh, instead of uh, attacking what I've said, it, it inevitably comes back to an attack on me and my credibility as chairman. And that does bother me. One of the reasons that we have not been able to complete our investigation is we have had 121 people, which is unparalleled in American history, take the Fifth Amendment or flee the country. And cases have been held open at the Justice Department, I believe, that should have been closed that have precluded the possibility of us bringing those people before the committee because they can still exercise their Fifth Amendment privilege. If the Justice Department would close those cases, we believe we could force them to come and testify. But unfortunately, the Justice Department is holding those cases open ad infinitum, and we can't get to those people. And that's why I feel so frustrated, and that's why I made the statements that I did today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Young, some have observed that while the Justice Department refuses to share information with the Congress, some of that very information winds up in the front page of the paper. And I believe um, the Washington Post editorial had some of that information relating to a resources committee investigation fairly recently. How does, what does that do to your investigation? Well, it, it destroys the, an investigation. And, and I have to say one thing. I, I, will, I will say this Justice Department without any reservation. Uh, I think I will say it not as a, I've been here longer than Mr. Charles, he has been. I've been here 27 years. 
I've worked with six administrations, and this is probably the worst um, Justice Department to respond to the Congress and responsibility of oversight. But saying that, I, I agree with Mr. Huckster. I think we have to get outside of, of the Justice Department when it comes to um, pursuing uh, subpoenaed witnesses. Um, I don't know whether we could do it through the courts, but somehow that has to happen because what's happening to us, uh, we subpoenaed a, uh, an individual. They claimed that this was there, there was a line attorney within the Justice Department, and um, she would not be allowed to appear uh, before the committee. We had to subpoena her. She would not allow to do it. Uh, it was shown that, uh, in fact, they falsely identified her, and we did have her before the committee, and she did give her testimony. Uh, but I, I will tell you, I do believe there's been a lot of leaks out of this department uh, that have tried to um, uh, destroy any, any type of investigation and get to the bottom of the problem. And I will also say that, uh, as I say, under all administrations, the use of regulatory law or executive order and people involved establish an agenda that goes beyond uh, their role, which is really the role of the Congress, is, is unparalleled. This, this has been one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. So I'd like to, to suggest that and, and, as we change this, and you can say all you want, oversight is our responsibility <laughs> to make sure the agency which we have responsibility overseeing operates lawfully, legally, and correctly for the American people. I don't believe this has happened. I think the Interior Department is probably the worst shape it's ever been in. Uh, they've misused their powers. They misused the, the land the trust funds, for instance, is one I'm really interested in. Uh, Mr. Babbitt's involvement of that, it's just it's a criminal act. Now, I, I will say we're going to continue to pursue. We're going to continue to do what we have to do. It is a very difficult road to hold because the Justice Department, frankly, doesn't want it to happen. And they don't care about justice. They care about protecting their party. I've lived through John Dingell. He's my dear friend. Um, he, when the, uh, your party was in power, uh, they subpoenaed people. They went to the Justice Department and agreed with them. They never stonewalled it, even with uh, George Bush and Gary Ford and Richard Nixon and Jimmy Carter. This administration won the stonewalls. And that's not justice because it affects the people which I work with and represent. I'm not picking on individuals in the private sector. I'm picking on people that have done illegal things within the Department of Interior. Um, Mr. Hyde, some time ago, Georgia legislature passed a law saying that agencies of government using taxpayers' funds may not lobby specific bills. What do you think of that idea? Well, that's a concern I have. I think the Justice Department has a point of view that they're entitled to express um, we need to know where the department stands on this or that legislation. But when they actively lobby, um, uh, I think they've crossed the line. Uh, I don't think uh, government agencies should lobby. Uh, they should provide information. And I admit that's a fine line, but I think that's, a, that's appropriate. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all uh, very much for your thoughtful remarks and for expending the time and uh, effort that you put into this. I wanted to follow on on just one point that, uh, that Don raised, and and I suppose I should probably raise this with you, um, Henry, and that is um, apparently uh, both Janet Reno and Webb Hubble uh, in the early part of their administration when the Democrats were in control of this place were extraordinarily accommodating in dealing with this issue, which I believe is a priority, programmatic and policy oversight. And I've underscored that. I mean, that's one of the things that, again, Speaker Hastert and I discussed at the outset. We want to pursue programmatic and policy oversight. So that when it came to that, there was um, an environmental crimes program, and uh, it was entitled Damaging Disarray. And, and both Webb Hubble and Janet Reno were very, very um, warm and extending invitations to have the legislative branch look cl closely at that. I mean, to what do you attribute the fact that there has been, uh, quite frankly, based on everything I've read, quite a bit of recalcitrance in, in allowing for, um, for the legislative branch to raise similar questions? I just think, the, regardless of the um, administration, um, there's always going to be a tension.
between uh, an agency, a, a department of government, and Congress. We are viewed as an annoyance, um, unprofessional, um, headline hunting. Uh, we, we just are, are not exactly welcomed into the bosom of any government well, but the concern I have is that Don was indicating that in, I guess, the first two years of the administration, when we saw the president's party controlling the Congress, that tension was not nearly as great uh, as it has been. Well, I think there was a, a um, uh, symbiosis between the uh, Congress and the White House. They, they were on the same page of the same hymn book. Uh, when it becomes adversarial, then uh, people's back gets up and uh, there's a resistance. I, and I think it's human. I think it's natural. I think it's gotten out of hand, too. Um, nobody trusts anybody. Everybody thinks uh, everyone is moving from base motives. Um, I know in our long and much lamented impeachment inquiry, um, I did my level best. I racked my brain to try and be fair. Uh, but uh, we were attacked and criticized, and po the polarization was total. And um, it was harmful, and I think it still lingers, unfortunately. You know, David, I, I just like, personally, I, I, it's my opinion, that, uh, and Henry is absolutely correct, um, when we took control, um, this administration decided to do things without the concurrence with Congress, and they did it through executive order. They set policy um, that was done by uh, uh, regulatory action and circumventing the Congress. And we believe, and many times it was done illegally, uh, that that is the role of the Congress. Uh, and I think there is a collusion with the Justice Department, uh, that they have decided, all right, if we do this, what will be the result? The result will be zero because the Justice Department, because although something illegally has occurred, the Justice Department will not pursue the illegality of that action, knowing full well that over a period of time, their term is over. And on this, is, I'm not being partisan. It just disturbs me because when they do that, they're, they're circumventing our due process. And what we've been trying to do, we did it with Escalani, we're doing Warner Creek, show the Department of Interior, through the influence of the White House directly, has circumvented the constitutional authority of this Congress. Now, that's against the law, and they have decided to make this an issue that when they're out of the office, it'll be too late to do anything about it, and they will achieve their goals out in the legislative process. And I think they've done this in collusion. They think this is a sit-down, war room action that they have put together. And it, I know Dan's frustration, this is not about Democrats or Republicans. This is about a policy being set by the executive branch, which is the, only within the authority of the Congress. I think it's a very uh, important point that you make. I mean, I think that, that the tension to which Henry referred is something that the framers really wanted in this struggle between the legislative and executive branches. So I don't think there's anything that's particularly wrong about that. One of the questions that I, I, I have to follow up on that, though, is that, I mean, is it true that we have seen really a shift for the uh, use of executive privilege really from the from the Department of Justice, in fact, to the White House? Um, Did you say executive privilege? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, executive privilege, really. Executive privilege was yeah. claimed by several people in several circumstances where I think it was very inappropriate. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was, uh, we considered that as an abuse of office, uh, but we decided not to make it a count in our uh, in articles of impeachment. But yes, I think executive privilege is a narrow doctrine and a good one, an appropriate one, when appropriately applied. But we, th we felt it was abused. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, just to start off with, I, <clears throat> Mr. Barton, who was here a little while ago, referred to uh, Mr. Al, Mr. Franklin Haney, 
and he said that he was charged with uh, certain campaign violations, but he failed to say that he was acquitted. And I think if we're going to say that somebody is challenged and charged, that we also ought to say that they're also acquitted as well. Secondly, our own rules of the House of Representatives are spelled out and are pretty, they're pretty clear to us as to what we're supposed to do as far as oversight. It says that the general oversight responsibilities are to analyze, appraise, evaluation of, of uh, federal laws, enacting new or additional legislation. Uh, we're to uh, look at changes, enactment of changes for additional legislation. We're to look at the organization and operations of uh, federal agencies. Um, and it goes on and on and on. And I guess the problem I have is that it seems so much of our investigations in the past few years have been really one-sided, and there hasn't been as much oversight um, as we really have the ability to direct. You, all of you have talked about the tension that's between the, uh, the administrative and the, and the legislature, and that's the way it is. That's the way it was set up. I think it's a good tension attention uh, because we have a good set of checks and balances in our government. But I'm concerned about the tension between members of the legislature, Republicans and Democrats, is something that uh, it should be us investigating and having oversight against whatever administration is in power, Republican or Democrat. It shouldn't be, we shouldn't be against one another. And I'm so very concerned about the partisanship, the cost of these investigations, the lack of bringing Democrats into the whole process from the standpoint, whenever we see a report, except for the Cox report, that was a good report. It was critical of the administration. It was critical of past administrations. You had Republicans and Democrats that joined. Um, it, it received a lot of good publicity. It was bipartisan in nature. Uh, there will be changes that come as a result of it. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. I'm concerned about the tensions between the Republicans and Democrats in the Congress. Would, That's what I'm concerned about. May I, may I just respond to this uh, question? I would like to as well. When you, when I don't mean to preempt you. Well, you want to go first? You want yes. To? Well, I just have something short and simple, if not sweet, to say. Our good friend Barney Frank, who I think is here, um, did he? Well, he was quoted in the Washington Post this Monday, along with Leader Gephardt, on the question of cooperation with us. And the Gephardt doctrine apparently is not to cooperate so that we become a do-nothing Congress. And therefore, it is easier for the Democrats to regain power and take over the majority, which is the, the summa bonum, the, 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 the highest good, take power. Um, Mr. Frank made a amplifying comment that we don't have to legislate. Now, how would you suggest, Tony, that we react to that? How can we draw you guys out to make you want to cooperate with us and make you want to pass legislation that we might get some credit for, but you too. Tell us what to do. All right. I remember when uh, we were in the majority, the Democrats, I was chairman of the Select Committee on Hunger. We didn't have legislative authority. We had oversight authority. And we looked over uh, agriculture department, uh, uh, agencies of AID, hunger programs, uh, programs dealing with medicines, all kinds of programs dealing with poor people in our own country and overseas. Um, my committee was a very bipartisan committee. I was the first committee to, <clears throat> um, I was the first committee in those days to offer uh, the Republicans at least one third of the budget. Uh, we never had a disagreement in open. My uh, co-chairman, or the vice chairman at the time, was a fellow by the name of Bill Emerson, a good friend of all of us, who has passed away. Great man. Uh, we were very good friends. Whenever we had a problem, we worked it out behind 
the scenes, we never had a partisan problem. We passed so many pieces of legislation through our oversight. We analyzed bills in our foreign policy and agriculture department that laws that are still in place today. Uh, we worked it out. We were partisan. We never had a fight. We passed laws. We analyzed. And um, this committee, even though it's not in existence today, this committee got more awards in the Congress than any other committee put together that I can remember in any Congress. We were called the conscience of the Congress. And it's not because I was chairman. It, it had to do with the relationship that was built up between Republicans and Democrats. And that's how we do it. We yield on that, Tony. I'm glad to yield. But what you're saying is that was because the minority in that instance was willing to work with you and cooperate. They were willing to work with us, but you got to remember that the party in power then in the White House was Republican. And we worked together the same kind of situation that we have today, except it's reversed. The Republicans are in power in the Congress. Democrats control the presidential. And what I'm saying is, is my people back home, Republicans and Democrats, they have come to me over, you know, through these investigations. And they said, when, when are you people going to get together? When is the Republican Party going to stop being so, appearing to look so vindictive and mean and spending all this money? Because what are the results? Where are the results coming from? May I respond? Please. I, I recall as a very young man when Howard Baker, during the Watergate hearing, as a Republican, said, when did the president know it and, and the, you know, the rest of the statement? We have never had that kind of response in our investigation from the Democrat minority. There's, there, 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 there appears to be a different attitude, and, 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 and I wish it weren't so. I think you're a very good man, Tony. I've worked with you in the past. I've watched you. I've watched you work on these hunger issues. But a lot of our colleagues are not as, as, as amenable to working together as you are. Now, let's talk about the cost and duration, because I think it's a very important point. The White House blocked us for months and months and months from getting documents. Uh, the chief counsel, Charlie Ruff, came to my office, the chief counsel of the president, and he told me they were not going to claim executive privilege. And then later he said they were going to claim executive privilege. He said they were going to give us all the documents that we wanted. And he didn't until I moved to hold, I told him I was going to hold him in contempt of Congress. And then he said, okay, we're going to give you everything you want. He gave us 10 or 12 boxes of documents, said that was everything, and four months later, we got more boxes of documents. Everything was being dragged out and dragged out and dragged out. I don't want to talk about the Lewinsky matter, but if you'll recall, in that particular case, the stonewalling by the White House that went on caused additional expense to the taxpayers of this country because there was lying and withholding of information. That's the same thing we experienced in our investigation. If we had had cooperation, that would never have occurred. Now, let me just say one more thing, and that is regarding the oversight and the problem we've had with the, with the Attorney General and the Justice Department. Oversight would be minimized if we had cooperation with agencies, particularly the Justice Department. If they would work with us to have witnesses testify, we wouldn't have this problem. But we've had 121 people take the Fifth Amendment or flee the country and they have kept cases open, I am confident, I'm, I'm dead sure they've kept cases open well beyond when they knew they were going to be closed simply to keep us from getting at those witnesses. Now, when you have that kind of a problem, there is that tension within the committee and between the agency and the committee. And that's the reason I think there's a lot of this acrimony. I would like to see it go away, but I don't think it's going to go away until everybody starts really trying to work for proper administration of justice and getting to the bottom of these things. And finally, I would like to sit down with you and show you, show you bank records that show that the Democrat National Committee still has hundreds of thousands, over a million dollars in funds that should be returned that were illegal conduit contributions that they're still keeping and have not returned. I'll be glad to show it to you. And they're not cooperating. And I can't get minority to work with us on that. Dan, I, I'm not on your committee, so I can't speak to these particular issues specifically. Right. But 
when I see you and I read about you in the paper, I hear about you in committee hearings and I watch it, I don't get the impression there's anything that you agree with relative to Democrats. And are there two or three things that you and Democrats have worked together in the past, let's say, year on? Oh, sure. Right now like we're what? working we're, we're working on a bill right now that's been filed. You were talking about campaign finance reform. Uh, I've got a bill that uh, has Democrat sponsors, which is going to make uh, it a, a, a much more severe penalty for people to be involved in conduit contributions. I think everybody in the par both parties agree with that. Illegal campaign contributions coming through a conduit should be a felony, and there should be more civil penalties. And I'm, there's a bipartisan bill. I could go into four or five bills like that. Dan, you also, in my opinion, you represent me. I'm part of the Congress, and you, are, you have a constituency. You represent the country. When you're out in the public, you, you're representing my wishes, too, of wanting to be able to do something sure. for this country. And when you appear and look so tough and so vindictive towards an opposition party, you create a tension in this Congress and among the people out there that disgust our constituents so much. And I don't want you to do that. You represent me, too. I, w I want you to be the kind of person that is tough, and fair. Well, I, and I, I want you to do everything you can to reach. Well, out. I, I don't want to get into a long dialogue. We're getting but look, pretty far afield. I here. know, but let me just respond because I think it's extremely important that this this point be made. If the administration of justice is being done properly, you will hear me praising. Today, you heard me praise Louis Free and Chuck Labella. I think they're two very fine men who did a good job. But if I see an obstruction of justice by even the attorney general herself, I think it's incumbent upon me as your representative and a representative of the people to make sure that justice is administered properly and those who don't do it are taken to task. And if that's being vindictive, then so be it. I want to say one thing, that, Tony. Uh, you, want to, you want to stop this? I don't have that problem. You know, I work pretty good with everybody. Very successful in my committee. But I also remember how I was treated when I was a minority. And I was never consulted. I was never worked with. And I not yet have anybody on my side of the aisle say, yes, the Department of Interior is doing anything right. On the other side, I have not had anybody say it's doing anything wrong. My job as a chairman is to protect the people of this country when it comes to, I think, executive orders that go beyond the control of the Congress, which you are part of. Now, if you really want to get serious about this, Mr. Chairman, um, you want to make us more happy, shut that dumb TV off. And I say that with any respects. I mean, dead serious. That has caused, I was here before I was here. That's caused us more animosity towards one another because every morning we have these one minute speeches and we throw a bomb this way and you throw a bomb this way. How, how can you work with people after you say you're no damn good? That's we what should, I'm saying. I mean, we should put those one minutes at the end, end of the, the day. I have, and, I have a sponsor, Tony and I have both signed and, that letter of Bill Archer. That way, people might get along. And I, I'm running out of time, guys, so I have to go to a meeting. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Mr. might I be excused? Certainly. Well, no, you well, guys but, have Mr. Goss, do you have any you questions? Want you want to? We'll do it. Uh, uh, Don, I, I appreciate your testimony. And you, you alluded uh, several times uh, about uh, when you were asking for information from the department about their quote, long-standing practices and other views uh, said the uh, same thing. Uh, I just wonder, really, two, two, two questions. First of all, what were some examples of the long-standing practices by which they wouldn't give you information, number one? And number two, uh, when you were here in other administrations, did you uh, uh, experience the same, uh, the, the, you know, the same excuses or same reasons? Well, actually, uh, Mr. Hastings, uh, Everything we hear from them when they say they can't respond to our inquiry is to say there's a criminal investigation. Well, I'll be honest with you. I'm not investigating anything that isn't criminal. Uh, but they use that as an excuse. That we can't give you the information because there's a criminal investigation. And they just delay it and delay it and delay it. And I'm, very frankly, um, uh, sometimes find out that the that they're doing it just to keep me from achieving my goal, and that's to find the people that have broken the law. And if I can trace that to the top man, I'm going to do it. But I believe a lot of these things that have occurred have, have it, it had no reason to occur other than Stonewall. And I, that's my, you know, my, um, my real problem. But, uh, the second part of that, then, is uh, obviously you're in a, in a minority situation when uh, 
uh, when we had other administrations in, in power. But did you uh, experience the same thing, or did the committee in general experience those same, uh, those same? Uh, no, we, the ones I can remember the investigations, there was total cooperation. I, I mentioned this with uh, George Bush, uh, you know, uh, all the other ones, total cooperation. I will admit sometimes I wasn't informed of what was going on by the chairman. Of course. He accuses me of the same thing right now. I try to do my best uh, to inform him. Uh, but most of the investigations when I um, was uh, in the minority were not directed at um, the agencies, but more uh, directed to private sector. Uh, and they used a lot of things, I think, at that time uh, incorrectly, and some of it was correct. The private the use of subpoenas were, were done all the time. But they did not investigate the agency as much as I'm doing, because, again, I say this administration has used the executive order so many times and regulatory law so many times in interpretation against the will of the Congress. And that is our role. No agency should run rampant and not be held responsible by this Congress. If we don't do that job, then we're not doing what we saw to hold up the Constitution. The people can't do it. I mean, it's got to be us. And that's really what I'm running into right now. And I'm going to continue this pursuit. And I do have to go by the way. Uh, I invite others to respond. Uh, yeah. Pete? Yeah. I, I just want to... What's the impact of a Justice Department taking that kind of behavior? As we went through the Teamsters, we heard it over and over and over. You can't talk to this person. We can't give you these records. We don't want you to have this person testify because there's a potential for litigation. There's, you know, there's an ongoing criminal investigation. A year and a half later, nothing has happened. So what this now tells me is that you know, either they didn't find anything, or they're not prosecuting it, or whatever. But the next time we go through a similar case, and the Justice Department comes back and says there is a potential for litigation or an ongoing investigation, that doesn't automatically stop our effort. We, at that point, as chairman, have to make a decision as to whether we are going to honor their request or not. What they are doing is they're losing their credibility with us that there is actually an ongoing investigation that has any credibility that we should honor their request. So in the future, I'm going to be much more um, questioning when they come to me and say, Pete, we can't, you can't do that. You're going to jeopardize an investigation. It's going to be kind of like, we've been there, done that. And the last time you came to me with that, you know, and you raised that, that, that flag, you didn't do anything and you never delivered. I may just go ahead this time because you don't have any credibility with, any, with me anymore and I'd rather move ahead with my investigation because in the past when you've slowed mine down, you've never delivered or followed up. That's, that's the risk that they're running. Right. Dan, you were uh, body language uh, ready to... Turn your mic. Oh, I won't belabor the point. I'll just uh, say ditto to both uh, what... Uh, my colleagues have just said the Justice Department has stonewalled uh, our committee. 121 people have taken the fifth. I, I believe, and I believe that there will, that there's very well in the next few weeks might be some evidence to the uh, effect that shows that the Justice Department is deliberately keeping cases open so Congress cannot exercise its oversight responsibilities. And if that's the case, then I think that's definitely obstruction of justice, and uh, they should be held accountable. But there's no question, I think all of us have said the same thing. They, they, they hide behind 6E material, grand jury material. They hide behind investigations that are allegedly ongoing, and they keep us from doing our job. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I've sat through the testimony this morning uh, of not only Mr. Ken Jorsky, but also my colleague, Mr. Hall, and I think that very good points have been made on both sides. Uh, just to let Mr. Hall know, as a freshman, I sat in the very first meeting of government reform and oversight with Mr. Burton, and from day one, day one, a decision was made not only to attack personally Dan Burton, but it has continued today. And when someone is constantly personally attacked by the other side, 
that is an indication to me of an unwillingness to work together. What I have heard today seems like revisionist history. We've been led to believe, you know, there were not some 900 FBI files in the personal residence of the president and first lady. No wonder we've never been able to resolve that matter. No one will tell the truth. No one, when they raise their hand, will admit to what they did. It's a mockery of justice. We saw the President of the United States in a sham explanation to the American people openly lie. He calls it not telling the truth. It's a lie. The American people are sick and tired of people when they raise their hand intentionally misleading and lying to people. As a member of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, I was day after day disappointed to see how the Department of Justice would encourage people not to participate with us. We had the director of the FBI and Mr. Labella, Mr. Free and Mr. Labella, openly come to us and explain beyond a reasonable doubt their not only view of the law, but what they were thinking and and the thought process they had. The Attorney General showed up and would not even discuss with us what was on her thought process, what the advice she received, and why it might not be pertinent. I believe that one of the questions I've got is this. Is it possible for us to develop a process that even the most sensitive information, even the most sensitive information could be explained and discussed appropriately with full disclosure, openly and honestly, between the administration and the appropriate leadership, either of the House of Representatives and the Senate or of committees. I believe that as chairman of the Intelligence Committee, Porter Goss should be privy to the most sensitive information that our country has. I believe that as chairman of the Judiciary Committee and the ranking member, that they should be privy to the most sensitive information of ongoing investigations and the thought process that are going on in the Department of Justice. Yes, they should have an obligation not to disclose that information. And yes, it should be put in a way to where they can provide information without allowing them to co-op with the Attorney General. But if we do not allow ourselves or have the ability to hear forthrightly, to gain the information, or if we are blocked from that information because someone who might be in official capacity appears to have an upper hand because they're the upholder of the law as though we would not be concerned about it, I think is a mistake. I hope that what we're able to do today is to look very carefully at the instances that have been brought up by, I think, well-meaning, honest members of Congress. Yes, they represent Dan Burton and Mr. Hyde and Mr. Holkstra represent me also. But the integrity of this institution, the ability that we have to work through the most sensitive and difficult problems without being stonewalled and lied to and accused of, for political purposes of trying to find the truth should not be a casualty today. I, like you, Mr. Hall, and my colleagues that are in this room, understand that if we cannot make this system work, that the American public will not trust us and they will seek something else. This is simply an experiment. That's what constitution, constitutional law is all about. But it requires forthrightness on all sides, not just two sides, but three or four, if that's how big the triangle or the square might be. And I believe that these hearings today have beyond any reasonable doubt proven that we have a problem, that we have a problem when honest, legitimate people are attempting to ask questions and political charades and innuendos are thrown at people. I don't admire it and I don't like it. And the day that a gentleman like 
uh, Mr. Goss ask questions about our national security or Mr. Dix, whether there be a Republican president or a Democrat president and they cannot find out the truth and to, to, to appropriately make decisions, then I think that freedom has been jeopardized. I hope that we can, through this process, work clearly and carefully so that we avoid problems in the future rather than this being just another hearing that we disagreed because we're on two different sides because it was some political mission that Republicans were on. I believe that the American public knows the truth and they'd like for us to get beyond it appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Goss. Thank you. I, um, I assure my friend uh, from Texas that uh, we do our best to stay on top of the Oversight and the Intelligence Committee, and we do it on a bipartisan basis, I think, as Mr. Hall would agree, and we've had a great deal of success. But I would admit to considerable frustration with the Department of Justice on investigations, uh, which I think they are taking advantage of uh, in order to uh, not discuss with us matters which I think are our purview. Uh, I could mention some uh, active espionage cases that are ongoing, names that we would be aware of, Chung, Wang, Shaw, uh, Tree, uh, that I believe that there is active espionage involved in some matters that we need to know about. I may be wrong, but I need to know about it. Uh, counterintelligence is a matter that has recently caught our attention in the Cox report, and the Cox report did work on a bipartisan basis, and the results of the Cox committee, uh, the Cox-Dix committee, was unanimous. It was bipartisan. It was a pretty good report. I, I will say, however, it, it was not an easy berth uh, to get from uh, the decision we made unanimously on a bipartisan basis to what we were able to tell the public. And I think part of that goes to the, uh, the problems we are having disclosing um, uh, information to the public that is rightly the public's because the administration, for one reason or another, uh, is not of the same mind that the public should have uh, all that information. And that is a curious and serious problem. I know this to be true. I know that the Chrome Avenue Detention Center, a few years ago, there was a willful deceit of an oversight committee of Congress not to reveal the truth, but not only not to reveal the truth, but to conduct a charade to hide uh, an activity that the department had taken. Uh, had to do with immigration uh, and the question of uh, overloaded Chrome detention, uh, trying to uh, deceive a congressional delegation. Now, finally, a whistle was blown on that, uh, and uh, belatedly, some action was taken. I know that other matters have taken where I have had apologies uh, from very high-level members working in the Department of Justice for uh, matters where that we did not get timely, full, and accurate response. And the way it was handled uh, was that members of the administration confronted uh, finally said, you know, we've looked into that and there is absolutely no reason that we owe you an apology. So I, I know that there have been troubles, and some of them I will put down to, well, there's an awful lot of water that goes over the dam in government business, and people in responsible positions can't possibly know it all. And the question I would address to the panel is this question, that no matter how good uh, the effort is at bipartisanship, uh, loyal opposition uh, as we uh, operate in a democracy, I would ask this question. I think we all understand in a political world where there is sunshine shining in that we want to put our best foot forward. But I would ask the question is, when does putting your best foot forward become willfully deceiving the American public with misinformation, disinformation, or omission of information? I don't know that we've made that decision or that standard. And I think that is the problem we have. Uh, I can well understand that somebody wants to tell me uh, a piece of information that puts them in the best possible life if it has political consequences. But I cannot accept the fact that somebody will come out and try and hide information or mislead me when they are speaking from an uh, official public position. Uh, I wonder how, uh, I will give a specific on that, I wonder how the President of the United States could come forward on March 19th uh, after all of the discussion about the Cox report and say, what security problem at the Sandia Labs? That to me, or at Los Alamos, that is a hard question for me to understand. Why would the president uh, shake his finger and say uh, to, to the American people, this is what it is? 
when he probably knows this is what it isn't. I think that is a serious problem, uh, and I, I think it uh, flows down through our relations through several agencies. I, uh, my portfolio goes into uh, several agencies, as you know. And I am concerned that we are getting in the position of habitually getting used to spin and hype and exaggeration uh, and accepting it, uh, and truth is a casualty. And uh, I think that's totally unacceptable. I think it's demeaning to Americans. I think it's demeaning to the institutions that we represent. And I think it's demeaning to the people we represent. And I think for that reason, this is a useful hearing. I don't want this hearing to be considered as a, as a piling on. Uh, I'm not speaking of it that way, because uh, I, I don't want to talk party, partisan politics. I want to talk about the merit of truth. And I don't think there's anybody more senior or respected uh, in this institution than Mr. Hyde, who has a position of responsibility, who has dealt across the board. And I would very much regard uh, a judgment from you on if you can discern between what's allowable spend of putting your best foot forward and what's going over the line. I've thought long and hard about the generic problem we all confront today. <clears throat> if everybody was Tony Hall, this would be a, the smoothest operating Rolex you ever saw, because I know where Tony's heart is. If political power is the ultimate goal, not doing good for America, not walking down the stairs of the Capitol for the last time saying, I did some good, I made the community a little better, um, I pulled my weight, but political power, if that's the ultimate goal, then whatever you do to attain that political power can't be too bad, including lying, including covering up. And I'm afraid political power is the ultimate goal of too many people rather than the notion that you came here to do some good. And, and I think that's the problem. Uh, people's goals are not as lofty or as idealistic as they should be. And the only thing we're getting out of it is cynicism, massive public cynicism. And uh, this great experiment, um, this, this representative democracy is going to founder because good people aren't going to want to serve in it. Um, I, I, that's my analysis of, of where we are. And it, where some of us are on two different tracks. Some of us would like to work, have to work. Nobody had to work with Democrats more than I did because I needed two-thirds vote in the Senate. I had to have Democrats or we was all a, a flop as it turned out to be. I couldn't get any Democrats. I could not get any Democrats, and I would have, I would have done contortions. I'd have stood. I'd have done one-finger push-ups. <laughs> I'd have tried. Well, I thought about it, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, it just wasn't to be because it was a struggle for power. It was protect the administration, and circle the wagons, and anybody who wants to bring bring this down is an enemy of the people and, and, and that's what happened truth became a victim because anything to keep that power was okay and that's wrong no I, I don't what you're saying to me Henry is that this basically is an individual matter of honor and, and I suspect that's right in the, in the end in the end well, maybe that's the, the basis of the success of our democracy, and, and we should be hopeful. on both sides can help persuade people to act honorably. I would agree with that. Can, can I make one brief comment? If the chairman will yeah, allow. I mean, in response to your, your question, the, I think the record shows regarding Los Alamos, and you brought that particular case up in the nuclear theft, that in... 1996, late 1996, and possibly even 1995, but late 1996, Mr. Berger, the head of the National Security Council, knew about the espionage. He'd been informed about it. We, we, we know that from our, our, our investigation. And he advises the president on national security matters. It's inconceivable to me that he wouldn't have gone right into the Oval Office and said there's a problem at Los Alamos. But the president said up until just a short time ago that as far as he knew,
There was no espionage or threat to our security from nuclear theft during his administration. Later, Mr. Berger, who told the Cox Committee he didn't know about it at that time, said, well, he'd made a mistake, he'd made a misstatement, and that he did know about it in late 1996. And later, it was said by the head of the Department of Energy, Mr. Richardson, that the president knew about this in, in, in early 1997. Now, the credibility of the entire government is at stake when those misstatements are made because they're perceived as out-and-out -out lies, and we're talking about national security. The reason I'm so upset, Tony, about a lot of things that are going on is because I believe, after our investigation for two years, and I'm not trying to be acrimonious or partisan now, I believe the administration knew about the campaign contributions coming in, and now I believe they knew at the same time there was espionage going on. And it, it bothers me that that was going on and it, there apparently was nothing being done. I mean, if campaign contributions are coming in from illegal foreign sources in, in, in China, and at the same time there's espionage, that's very troubling. And, 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 and the American people have a right to be concerned, and I think we as members who are investigating these things have a right to be concerned as well. Thank you all. You've been helpful with your testimony and generous with your time, and we're grateful. Thank you. Mr. Frank, thank you for your patience. It's been a long, long morning. We're happy to have you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please turn on your, your uh, mic. Yeah, thank you. I welcome a chance to uh, address these subjects because as a member of both the Banking and Judiciary Committees, I've been a participant in many of these uh, events. And uh, I don't recognize what I've been hearing. I guess as I listen to this repetition of accusations disproven, um, I'm reminded of the old saying uh, in Washington, where there's smoke, there are politicians with a smoke machine. And I think we are in the midst of a big smoke machine. Um, I, for instance, heard the gentleman from Texas when I came back in talking about the FBI files being in the White House residence. Kenneth Starr, hardly uh, partisan of the administration, announced after the election conveniently that there was nothing to link Bill Clinton to that whatsoever. In fact, I asked Mr. Starr at what point he decided that the president was exonerated from involvement with the FBI files. He said, well, there was never a moment at which we exonerated him because there was never a prior moment at which he was in any way implicated. Uh, many of these issues were, in fact, investigated, some of the things that have been talked about, by Kenneth Starr. And I think what you have here is some frustration that Kenneth Starr found, uh, contrary to the views of some who've testified earlier, that Vincent Foster tragically killed himself, that he wasn't uh, nefariously done away with in some, in some plot. Now, that was a deeply held view of some responsible officials, and Kenneth Starr, uh, among everybody else who investigated it, said, no, he committed suicide. Kenneth Starr said against the president. In terms of congressional oversight, uh, I was on the banking committee in 1994 when we had a hearing chaired by then Chairman Gonzalez. The Republicans said that uh, this was an inadequate hearing, and so when the Republicans took over, they had a new hearing chaired by Mr. Leach and went thoroughly into uh, Whitewater. It was a very long uh, investigation and a week-long hearing. And uh, do you know what that report concluded, uh, Mr. Chairman? If you do, you are psychic, because there was no report. Uh, the banking committee under the Republicans in 1995 having used the fullest subpoena powers and everything else to investigate Whitewater and to try to prove something on the administration, follow the uh, old principle, if you have nothing bad to say, don't say anything, because this committee never filed a report. What you have here is an understandable frustration and a failure to uh, bring things up. And it wasn't because of Stonewall. You didn't know what I, I don't know if Mr. Hyde is still here. I was somewhat surprised to learn that he had cited me as an ex something I had said as an example of why he couldn't reach out to Democrats. Uh, my recollection when he wanted to move the civil asset forfeiture bill was that he didn't think my attitude was much of an obstacle. I, my recollection was that we had cooperated. Perhaps he thought that was not cooperation. I, I certainly thought it was. I do 
agree that with regard to some of the fundamental issues involving the role of government, compromise is unlikely and that those genuine philosophical issues ought to be carried to the public. But uh, uh, I would be disappointed to have the record that we've had in the Judiciary Committee in the intellectual property field or in civil asset forfeiture or a number of other areas characterized as one of non-cooperation. I, I can think of no case where I was asked to cooperate in a legislative issue where there were not fundamental ideological obstacles to agreement where uh, cooperation didn't go forward. And, and it's in that case that I want to just specifically address the Justice Department. Uh, Janet Reno, in my experience, is a woman of enormous integrity. Uh, she can sometimes be difficult for people to get along with. Indeed, it is ironic that she's probably not in the best of repute with some of the people in the White House, precisely because she has been unwilling to accommodate them in every case. But the suggestion that she's involved in cover-ups uh, or, is, or is obstructing justice seems to me entirely unjustified. And I do want to recall that in October of 1997, the House Judiciary Committee had an all-day hearing with Attorney General Reno based on a letter that was sent. And this was the basis for uh, impugning her integrity for failing to appoint an independent counsel. Um, and uh, it failed miserably, I think, to make the case. And not surprisingly, for example, on, on page 12 of that letter, uh, one of the suggestions was that because some people from Paraguay had given campaign contributions, when um, the White House denounced a potential military coup against the president of Paraguay, that that was a sign of political corruption. Uh, the notion that when an administration says that an elected official president should not be thrown out by the military, that that's somehow corruption, uh, did not rise to a serious level, and, and it wasn't treated seriously. Um, one of the arguments was that when the president in 1996 declared, this is in the letter, this is the basis on which Ms. Reno's refusal to appoint an independent counsel was challenged. When uh, the president in 1996 declared a substantial area in Utah to be a national monument, it was very controversial. Democratic member of the House may well have lost his seat over that, uh, uh, Mr. Orton. It was a controversial thing, but it was a request that the president uh, acceded to that had long been made by an environmentalist. This is a major issue about declaring that part of Utah to be uh, a national monument. And the letter uh, suggested that this was really uh, corruption because it was really motivated by the need to protect the coal deposits of the Riyadis. And when uh, the president takes an action of national significance involving an environmental matter that had long been debated and asked for by environmentalists, uh, when Ms. Reno was asked to appoint an independent counsel because this was really a secret plot just to protect the coal deposits of the Riyadis, it got no serious attention, nor did it deserve any. Um, there was also extortion of campaign contributions. This is from the letter of September 3rd, 1997, which represented the best efforts to, to, to document this. Uh, it says, well, uh, maybe Mr. Gore was guilty of extortion. Another donor recalled Gore phoning and saying, I've been tasked with raising two million and you're on my list. The donor said he felt pressured by the vice president's sales pitch. Uh, yet another major business figure said he was solicited by Gore and said, there were elements of a shakedown, it was awkward. The vice president has real power, and when he asked me for money, he gave me no choice. I have so much business that touches on the federal government. Well, if the, there was no allegation in any of this that the vice president did any more than ask for money. And the man said, well, the vice president's got power, and I have business before the government. Uh, not many committee chairs would go unindicted if this was the standard. I mean, the hypocrisy of this is just overpowering. The fact is that the vice president, like almost every other elected official in this city, asked people for money, some of whom had business before the government. And on that and nothing else, on no suggestion that there was anything other than a request uh, that was grounds for asking for an independent uh, counsel. And then there was the famous phone call that the vice president made. And if in fact everybody in the Capitol who had ever used a telephone in the Capitol to ask for money were to be thrown in prison, we would, I assume, be now meeting somewhere in a federal penitentiary and the press could come and interview us on visiting day. Uh, again, the hypocrisy of saying that that justifies independent counsel is overpowering. So what we have here is, I think, political frustration. People have tried very hard to get the president, and I have to say, you know, Texas is not here. He, he decried the political, the personal attack on, uh, on Mr. Burton. Um, uh, the notion that uh, 
fact, it's been one-sided on this is, of course, bizarre, uh, including some of the, the language that's been used about the president. Uh, from 1995 on, there has been an effort using the full panoply of congressional powers. We've had Mr. Starr fully investigating. Mr. Starr had no obstacles placed on him by Congress. Indeed, we couldn't place any obstacles on him by Congress. And it came up with nothing on Whitewater and nothing on the FBI files and nothing on the travel office. I mean, those are the ones that I know most about. I would ask to put in the record the letter from the Judiciary Committee majority, September 3rd, 1997, which is their best effort to show that there's a case for an independent counsel, and it's silly. He opposed a military coup in Paraguay. He declared a national monument in Utah. The vice president actually asked someone for money. These are the standards by which you impugn the integrity of the Attorney General. I think it's clearly partisan. And uh, I, I, I regret this, and I would just say, finally, I do think oversight is important. And there were times that I've been critical of the administration, but you discredit oversight when it is so blatantly political. And I think, in fact, our ability to engage in effective oversight has been undercut, not by obstruction, but by obsession, by transforming the legitimate oversight function into this uh, crusade to get the president, and what we now have is the frustration that's boiled over because that's been unsuccessful. Yield to Tony Hall right now because he's got a time constraint and he'd like to ask some questions. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank Mr. Frank for being here and um, he's been on two important committees uh, that have uh, certainly been involved in investigations and oversight. And um, of the money that's been spent, Mr. Frank, how, I don't even know what the actual numbers are, but just on the committees that you serve on last couple of years, or let's say in the last six years, how much money has been spent on the various investigations? Well, I would say between the, obviously between the banking and the judiciary committees, uh, uh, it's in the uh, well over 100,000. On, of course, that throws in the impeachment, but even if you set that aside, because we may have, uh, we, we had the star report, which called on that. Um, it is, I would say this, more money has been spent on trying to prove that the president committed crimes in both those two committees uh, or enforcing investigations than on any other single subject, in, 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 in including the kind of oversight I would like to see of the immigration service, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, clearly, it has been a major preoccupation of the Judiciary Committee. On the Banking Committee, I will say this. Uh, it was in 1994 in the Bank Committee under the Democrats because the Republicans asked for it, and then it was in 1995 um, Mr. Leach, whose committee has jurisdiction over federal banking regulation and thus Whitewater and all of its uh, related uh, uh, applications, after the lack of success in trying to find something negative in 1995, pretty much left it alone. So the banking committee has not really done much on this in 1985. The Judiciary Committee has from time to time continued to deal with it. What action? Of all these millions of dollars that have been spent, uh, there's been a figure that's been thrown around um, by a number of, uh, of our colleagues uh, to the tune of about $17 million over the past six years on investigations. Uh, I assume that would include the independent counsel. Yes. And um, as far as the investigations in the travel gate, Whitewater, how much, I mean, there been any results that have come from that? Well, the one result I can see has been the, uh, and it's, it's really been Mr. Starr, as nobody else, it's been the periodic indictment of Webster Hubble. Mr. Starr uh, has had this view that when in doubt, indict Webster Hubble uh, to, to give the indication of activity, and he has several times indicted him. Um, he did send him to prison once for things that Mr. Hubble did that he should not have done long before he was a member of this administration. Uh, I mean, the, the uh, conviction of Mr. Hubble affected uh, uh, matters involving a private law firm and money he stole from his partners in that law firm uh, long before Bill Clinton was, was president of the United States. Other than that, with regard to the travel office, the FBI files, there were some people fired at, in the FBI files. Kids, you should have been fired. They, they misbehaved. But remember, Kenneth Starr was the one who looked into that uh, as, as Whitewater. He started out with Whitewater. He had the FBI files in the travel office. Um, in terms of people serving in the Clinton administration, uh, in terms of any criminal charges, the answer was, uh, was nothing. 
And as I said, the Banking Committee in 1995, which had a full investigation of the Whitewater situation, never even made a report on it. So I am aware of no, uh, of no results here. Um, and it is true we looked at the uh, campaign finance and the Judiciary Committee, but apparently the conclusion there was that uh, the only problems were in enforcement, the laws were fine because people didn't think we should do anything about changing the law or tightening the law in any way. Do you think we need to change any rules? I mean, we have rules where it says that the standing committees have the ability to look at the laws, have oversight over the agencies, have hearings, change the laws. I mean, uh, why don't we just do oversight and uh, investigate the agencies and, and do the kinds of investigations? Well, I I wish we had, I, frankly, I think in some cases uh, oversight that is policy related took second place to um, this, this obsession, as I said, with trying to find out things that went wrong. Uh, I, I am not aware of any changes you could make that would uh, increase this. Indeed, I, you know, there are some areas, by the way, uh, in policy grounds, where I agree with Mr. Hyde. I, I think one of the inadvertent contributions Kenneth Starr has made to America is that he has made it possible now to deal with prosecutorial excess. Uh, a political climate exists to curb prosecutorial excess that didn't before. And prosecutorial excess includes the prosecutors who work for the U.S. Justice Department. And I have collaborated uh, with, with others in the House on trying to curb excess by, by the current Justice Department as well as others. But uh, beyond that, I, I, I don't see any Great obstacles, and in fact, I will say with regard to some of the investigations, not the judiciary, but I do think in the government reform investigation, I heard uh, stories of repeated lengthy depositions of individuals, frankly, which seem to me to be examples of, of uh, investigatorial excess against which I would like to protect people. Why do you think people, our constituents, uh, over the past uh, few years have, have stopped us on the street and said to us, uh, when do you think, uh, when are you going to start getting together? When are the Republicans and Democrats going to start working together? Why is the majority party so vindictive? Why are you spending this kind of money to investigate? What results are coming out of it? Well, I think there's a confusion about where there should be conflict and where there shouldn't be. I want to say again, and I, I do believe on fundamental issues of public policy whether Medicare should be contracted or expanded, whether there should be a big tax cut or instead an expansion of funding in areas involving education and environment. Um, issues such as abortion, those are legitimate public policy issues and there ought to be debate about those and I am not a great fan of compromise for its own sake and in some cases I think when the, when, when the elected officials are closely divided, our job is to frame the issues in debate and put them to the voters to decide. But what happens is instead, People don't like, and I, I think that people are sometimes uncomfortable f debating principle and debating philosophy. They feel that they'll do better if they can prove that the other side is a bad guy. Now, I have to say, that happens on both sides. I, I disagreed with Mr. Sessions' suggestion that, that uh, this was a one-sided set of personal attacks, say, on Mr. Burton. There have been personal attacks equally made on all sides, and I think, unfortunately. But people would rather, I think people feel that they get better leverage in an argument if they can prove that somebody is, is immoral and evil and crooked than if their ideas are wrong. It's easier to debate people's failings. Um, but the public, I think, correctly says, but that's just not the case, especially when it appears to be a double standard. Now, Mr. Hyde said correctly, there are inevitable executive legislative tensions. But some of what I've heard today, frankly, were accusations against the Clinton administration for acting as any other administration does. There, and, and I think when people see a kind of uh, double standard, they get ups upset. I also believe that the public says at some point enough. I mean, I don't know how many investigations it was going to take of uh, poor Vincent Foster's suicide before people let it alone. Uh, people were chewing on whitewater since 1994 uh, when we had the beginning of the Fisk investigation. And uh, people, I think, begin to say, look, at some point you have to accept that you're not going to be able to find anything. So I, I think it is the it is the preference for personal attacks over philosophical debate that unfortunately exists on both sides. But in this particular case, uh, a particular obsession with getting Bill Clinton and the less successful people were in getting something on him, the, the more driven they were, and I think that turned the public off. Frankly, I think that there was, uh, it will now turn out that Bill Clinton was never more popular than when uh, people were trying hardest to get him. 
Um, I think uh, the president's popularity has decreased since impeachment was over. He may be secretly hoping there are more hearings like this because uh, he did better when he, when he could appear to be the victim, when whatever uh, misbehavior he engaged in was overshadowed in the public's mind by the, what appeared to them to be the, the, the greater transgressions of the inquisitors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hall. I, I, I agree that the personal attacks versus the debate on principle is, is um, where we've come to. I, I, I look back at 75 charges filed in ethics com committee against Newt Gingrich to try and discredit him and, and some of that worked. I will say this, Mr. Frank, about your seemingly cavalier attitude about 900 FBI files in the White House and nothing was done about it. A Republican Justice Department put Chuck Colson in jail for having won inappropriately, holding one FBI file in the White House. And this Justice Department did not find that 900 of them taken in there for, were, was worthy of an ins investigation. Excuse me, no, you're, you're wrong. It's not, it wasn't the Justice Department, it was Kenneth Starr. First of all, I... No, no, I'm, I'm comparing it with the Republican Justice Department in the 70s. I understand that, but no, you, you were wrong to say that it was the Justice Department. The, the matter of the FBI files was turned over to Kenneth Starr for investigation. The decision not to take any action was Kenneth Starr's. I will say, I, I take exception to you saying I was cavalier about it. I said, I specifically remember this, that a couple of people were fired because of that and should have been. It was inappropriate. There was a difference between these files and Colson. Mr. Colson had that file for the specific purpose of doing damage to the individual, Mr. Ellsberg. There was no finding that anybody did any damage to individuals here. But in any case, whether you agree with the findings or not, the FBI file matter was given by the Attorney General to Kenneth Starr. And your quarrel with the results of the investigation into the FBI files is not with Janet Reno, but with Kenneth Starr, because he, as the independent counsel, was consigned that by Janet Reno. He's the one who said there was nothing to implicate the President. And he's the one who decided not to take any action of a criminal sort against anybody else, not the Justice Department. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frank, very pleased you're here to uh, help us out. I want to get back to the subject more at hand. Um, and, and it seems to be part of our problem is uh, we're, we're getting caught up in the, the finger pointing, uh, the partisanship. Uh, here on the Hill, and then the problem of the, the friction and the tension uh, between the executive branch and the legislative branch, which uh, our founding fathers uh, put in there for, I think, good and adequate reasons. So let's go to a impartial third party parity observer, judiciary. Let's go to the, the judge's side of it and get presumably an impartial view of some of the things that are going on in the Justice Department. I'm going to read from a case, American Physicians and Surgeons versus Hillary Rodham Clinton. And the judge wrote, and I'd like your views on this judge, uh, at least his opinion, not on the man, this is not ad hominem. This court found the government's discovery tactics were preposterous, incomplete, and inadequate. It is clear that the decisions here were made at the highest levels of government and that the government itself is and should be accountable when its officials run amok. Most shocking to this court and deeply disappointing is that the Department of Justice would participate in such conduct. This kind of conduct is reprehensible and the government must be held accountable for it. Now, presumably, we're part of the accountability process with our oversight. Do you, do you feel that a, a judge making a statement like that about a judicial process where uh, obviously something has gone wrong with the system of justice in our country because it has apparently been um, inappropriately uh, dealt with by the executive branch is something we should overlook. Oh, no, not at all. I'm glad that we have independent judges uh, that do that, and from time to time... No, no, I didn't say independent judge. I said judge. You object because I said independent judge rather than judge. I don't well, understand I, I, I the wanna, basis I for that objection. Make... I yeah, want to I, make I'm, sure you're not uh, equivocating what kind of judge. I mean, we, this is an appropriate, oh, well, what kind of seated are you getting into a judge. Of yes, I understand that. I, I, I must say, your argument that you want to rise above partisanship is undercut by that kind of hair splitting. I was saying that I, you said we have an impartial branch, the judiciary. I was trying to be conciliatory. I didn't realize you were not in the mood for, 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 for that. Um, what I said was, I'm glad we have an independent judge that did this. And when you take exception to my calling the judge independent, I don't know what that means. Was it a dependent judge? Was it a codependent judge? Did the judge have an enabler there on the bench? What, what are you talking about? 
the, but the, the answer is I'm glad that we have judges who are able in specific cases uh, to step in. If that had to do with the failure to open up the uh, process during the uh, health plan, I think the administration made a serious mistake there, and I'm glad the judge rebuked them. That, that is the, the point we're trying to get at. When the executive branch, any executive branch, through any administration, tries to derail or manage or shape a process of, of justice uh, to their advantage, to the advantage of that administration, it appears there's got to be accountability, and it would appear that that would be the job of this institution, the legislative branch, that has oversight legislative capabilities. When that is frustrated willfully by uh, a branch of the executive branch or by top leaders in the executive branch, that would appear to warrant the attention of uh, the Congress of the United States on behalf of the people. Would you agree with that? I thought I already had, but I'll be glad to repeat that. Yes, and that's been the case uh, in my experience throughout all the three administrations I've been here. As I said, I thought Mr. Hyde was right that there is this inherent tension uh, between the two. I must say the first time I encountered the notion that the administration could block any sanction came under the Reagan administration. There was an investigation into the Environmental Protection Administration involving Ann Gorsuch and others. And the Congress was voting a contempt citation. In fact, I think did vote a contempt citation. And the Justice Department under President Reagan announced that this contempt citation would have no meaning because it was entirely a matter of prosecutorial discretion as to whether or not any prosecution would, would take effect. And uh, indeed, what in an interesting case, the uh, Justice Department went to court under William French Smith in a case which was curiously titled the United States of America versus the House of Representatives, making us, I suppose, a kind of a voluntary association, in which the uh, Justice Department under, under President Reagan sought to enjoin the House of Representatives from going forward. And a judge, an independent judge, I hesitate to note, um, threw it out, and I'm glad that he did. So yes, I think when the executives, whether it's the Reagan or the Bush or the Clinton or the Carter or any administration, seeks to frustrate an investigation, that's legitimately a cause for uh, uh, us to do whatever we can to, to prevent that. I, I guess we can agree that all judges are independent unless proven otherwise. And if you mean it in that sense, that's fine. Um, the, let me continue. Just to make sure this wasn't one isolated incident. Uh, you mentioned that, well, this was a case about health care. Let me give you another case, different time. This time, February 22nd, 1999, Coble versus Babbitt, I believe the chairman has referred to this in part. Let me again quote to you some of the judge's statement. The way in which the defendants, which would be the Justice Department, have handled the, this litigation up to the commencement of this contempt trial is nothing sort of a, short of a travesty. The defendants decided to begin a campaign of stonewalling and strained interpretation of the court's orders in a desperate attempt to avoid the penalties they deserved. The court is deeply disappointed that any litigant would fail to obey orders for production of documents and then conceal and cover up that disobedience with outright false statements that the court then relied upon. But when the litigant is the Department of Justice, the misconduct is all the more troubling. The institutions of our federal government cannot be trusted, et cetera. That to me is a very troubling statement. I agree with you. Thank you very much. Mr. Hasty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, Chairman, I, uh, I have to say I always uh, appreciate uh, watching and, and hearing our witness uh, when he's on the floor testifying. Uh, his, his quick mind is, uh, is something to behold, and so I will say that. But what I want to ask, uh, what I want to ask you, Barney, is something that was um, alluded to and testified by some of the committee chairmen that were here. Uh, Don Young. Uh, talked about uh, some excuses that was used by some of the agencies as long-standing practices why we can't bring thus and so to the committee. Other of the chairman uh, mentioned exactly the same thing. The response, uh, and so I asked about that. I says, what are these long-standing practices? And they typically uh, had to do with litigation or grand jury or something like that, which of course is legitimate, to which um, uh, Peter Hoekstra responded by saying, well, this it is, is these sort of things which I, which I respect, but which at the end of the day, over a period of time, when there is nothing resolved in these inquiries, 
that causes a distrust, uh, at least from his part, from the oversight standpoint. Now, the question, I guess, is, um, uh, and I'd like to have your observations on this, is how do we overcome that? Because the separation of powers, to me, implies that nobody is higher than others, but yet in a response like this, it appears that in this case, the executive branch is, uh, with this agency is saying, we're higher, we're not going to do anything uh, to respond to what your oversights are. Two things. First of all, I completely disagree with the this administration and the Bush and Reagan and other administrations when they argue that they can't comment on something because it's under litigation. That's just nonsense. That's what lawyers say when they don't want to say something. And the, you have to separate out. I do believe that the secrecy of grand jury testimony is important. Remember, there's something unique about the grand jury. The grand jury is the only part of our system where it's not a fair shake. I mean, everything else we do is adversarial. There's a trial and there's a defense and a, and, and a prosecution or a defense and a plaintiff. Here, we have equal debate. In the grand jury, there's only the prosecutor. And I think we, we have made a decision to give the prosecutor advantages in the grand jury setting that we don't anywhere else in return for keeping it secret. But when you get to the broader question, and I have found this with administrations, and again, my only difference would be if people said, oh, this is a problem of the Clinton administration. It's a problem of all executive branches. Yes, it is a problem of the Clinton administration and the Bush administration and the Reagan administration. I first encountered it when James Watt told us in the old, what it was then called, uh, government operations, that he couldn't testify about some conversation he had with the department solicitor um, because of the attorney-client privilege. We said, well, wait a minute. The attorney-client privilege protects the attorney. You're the client. What, what are you talking about? Um, and then they would say, well, it's under... We can't discuss this because it's being litigated, except if you look at any administration, the Clinton administration, the Reagan administration, any, if something is under litigation and they want to talk about it, they do. They only use this excuse when it's not. There, there is no reason whatsoever why you can't talk about something because it's under litigation. So I agree that that's a problem. But here's the secondary problem. You're right. We should be able to compel them. The problem is that until fairly recently, the notion was that if you refuse to give Congress information when the appropriate procedures were followed, you could cite someone for contempt. But you have to go back to this situation involving Gorsuch, where the Reagan administration promulgated for the first time, to my knowledge, the notion that prosecutorial discretion meant that an administration, if it chose not to prosecute a contempt citation criminally, had the absolute right not to do that. Now, the Clinton administration in this seems to be fully at one with the Reagan administration. They like that idea fine. And that's the dilemma we have. Under that notion of complete prosecutorial discretion, there is no way to bring in the third party, the judicial system, to arbitrate the dispute. So in that case, whoever has the information wins. And I, I, that's a fair, I mean, that, people haven't focused on that enough. That was a big change. The assumption always was that if there was a dispute between the president and, con and, and, and the Congress about access to information, it would go to a neutral third party. And then the Reagan administration said, no, it doesn't, because of prosecutorial discretion. And the Clinton administration is born into that. Maybe what we should be doing is to say, OK, prosecutorial discretion applies, and we can't do a criminal contempt citation. But perhaps we should be, I, this was something I had once thought about, and it sort of dropped. We ought to put into effect a civil proceeding whereby when there is a dispute over information, we can get it to court, and you get around the prosecutorial discretion thing, because it would be civil and not criminal. And uh, that, I would very much think, would be a source of bipartisan legislative interest. That is, because you've got a good issue here. Congress wants information. The executive branch says there's a legitimate information for not sending it. There needs to be a procedure whereby that can be sent to a third party for a dispute. And I agree that all administrations tend to withhold. And uh, we, we ought to figure out a way to try and break that logjam. Because what has historically been the way that we thought we could get it to court was a criminal contempt citation. And that's been gone for the last 15 years. You said you thought about it and then dropped it. Why did you drop that thought? Something else came up. I oh, mean, okay. uh, you know, uh, I mean, literally, I remember thinking about it at one point, and then something else yeah. interceded. But I'd be willing to work on people again to, to do it and do it right away. One, one other thing that uh, I mentioned, I just this is probably more for clarification than anything else. Um, you were in and out of the, of the testimony that was going on by others. And when you came in, your opening uh, your remarks were, were such, at least what I heard, that a lot of this is driven by bipartisanship. Uh, and we, you know, Republicans and Democrats do have a, a, a different of opinion. 
But on the other hand, uh, if, if one side is driving something by partisanship, then it would be logical, it seems to me, to assume that the other side in response would be driving their decision by partisanship also. So yes. would, would, you, would you conclude then, oh, if, 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 if A is right in your case and B is right on the other case, oh, where we have the same partisanship, frustration? Partisanship uh, generally begets partisanship. Uh, I, this is not, I mean, would, no matter what we voted on the Ten Commandments and the National Day of Pressing, Fair and Humiliation, other cheek turning is not one of the major practices in this city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frank, Thank for you. your generous time. Let me just point out one thing about all the investigations going on. It's been estimated that there were 500 investigations undertaken in the first century and a half of our nation's history. Then in, 19, in uh, the 90th Congress, which is the first two years of the Nixon administration, there were 496 investigations in that Congress of the Nixon administration. Right. Now, the only thing I would say is this, Mr. Chairman. Um, in the case of the Clinton administration, there was a tendency to take the large number of investigation as a criticism of the executive branch. Uh, you seem to be suggesting in this case that it's the Congress's fault. And I'd say I, I say Congress does an awful lot of investigating. Right. In, in, yeah. in both cases. Yeah. But it, and, and you would also agree that the fact that Congress investigates a lot does not necessarily justify an inference that the administration being investigated deserved to be investigated. Not in every instance. Right. Thank you for your time. Here's a look at the House and Senate schedules for today. The House returns at 9 a.m. Eastern, when members will debate a bill to expand U.S. trade and investment to 